Hello and welcome. Uh, thanks for, to everyone for joining for this mini symposium on Julia in astronomy and astrophysics research. We're fortunate to have a, a series of speakers who each has been involved in uh, using Julia in their research and have some highly cited publications that make use of that. And so we're really excited to be able to hear from them, their perspective on what went well, what opportunities they see for improving things. Some uh, brief logistics. Uh, there's a, a couple of pre-recorded talks coming up first. During those, you can uh, open up Discord using the, the uh, code you got sent with your JuliaCon registration and ask speakers questions during the talks as they go. And, and they'll be there to be able to provide uh, text feedback during the talk. For, for questions about uh, either the panel discussion at the end, the, the live speakers, um, or ones you just think uh, about that later, you'll be able to ask those on Pigeonhole. There's a, a link in the, the banner and uh, most everywhere you can find info about this seminar. Uh, and then you can go to ask your questions as you think of them and you can upvote them. And when the, if there's time during the talk window, uh, we might ask one or two of those then. And if not, we'll be able to use those to help see the panel discussion the sessions at the end. Alrighty. Um, I guess our, our first speaker is Maurizio Tomasi. He's going to be talking about some of the work they've been doing to use Julia as part of a simulation pipeline. And I'll pull up that talk now. Hi. In this short talk, I will describe how my team used Julia to build a simulation pipeline for LSP Strip, a microwave observatory. I am an associate professor at the Università degli Studi di Milano and work in the field of observations of a cosmic microwave background. This is the reason why I am so interested in microwave astronomy. I've been a Julia user since version 0.2 and as I have mentored several students in the last years, I have taught Julia to several of them. In this talk, I will describe how my team has developed a simulation pipeline for a microwave observatory, LSP Strip. I hope that this will be of interest for people attending this mini symposium to hear how young people studying astronomy and astrophysics have learned to use Julia, what they have produced and what they did like or dislike about the language. So I'll first present an overview of experiment. LSP strip will measure the polarization of one third of the sky in the range between 40 and 90 gigahertz. The instrument is an array of 55 receivers uh, you see uh, her, uh, they here. Uh, there are uh, 49 of them at 40 gigahertz, the larger antennas, and the 6 and 90 gigahertz. Here you see at the border, 6 of them. There are coupled with a telescope, which is shown here, a sketch. Uh, next year, both the instrument and the telescope will be deployed to Tenerife in the Canary Islands. So, observing one third of the sky requires a well thought scanning strategy. The telescope will be moved uh, according to this uh, animation. Let me show you. Uh, so the idea is uh, to uh, make the instrument uh, point uh, with some uh, constant elevation angle, you see here. And then uh, it will spin regularly day and night around the zenith for the whole mission time, which is uh, nominally two years. This motion, combined with the daily rotation of the Earth as observed in Tenerife, will make strip cover a stripe in the northern sky. And this is shown in the right in green and blue. The just a position of the green and blue stripe in uh, equatorial coordinate show you the sky coverage, which is roughly one third of the sky. So, uh, we wanted to build a, data, um, uh, a simulation pipeline which simulates data acquisition. So, to simulate it, uh, one must produce, first of all, 55 timelines, uh, one for each receiver, 55 receivers. Uh, each timeline lasts uh, for two years. Then, once uh, you produce uh, these timelines, and you need to flag them, calibrate them, and most important, to combine all of them to produce a sky map of a polarized signal, shown uh, on the right. This map is not really what STRIP will observe. This is a map produced by the Planck collaboration. Of course, the STRIP will observe just one third of the whole sky, as I said. 
This kind of simulation pipeline requires several parts. Uh, you have to simulate the motion of the telescope and the Earth. You must compute astrometric positions for each sample acquired by each of the 55 receivers. The sampling frequency is uh, 100 Hz, 100 samples per receiver. Uh, you have to simulate the noise, uh, to pixelize the um, sky sphere, and uh, to run the map maker, which is a uh, task that uh, converts timelines into a sky map. This last part is not trivial. Uh, map making is a global optimization problem, which requires to process uh, roughly one terabyte of data without the possibility to split the job in chunks. All the data must be kept and processed in memory at the same time. So this task needs, needs to be extremely efficient. You have to deal with large amount of data and to process it quickly. This kind of uh, um, simulation pipeline, once you have it, uh, can be used to answer the so-called what-if question, where one assumes that the instrument exhibits uh, some non-ideal behavior and wants to estimate its impact uh, on the scientific outcome. What? Uh, if the level of noise is uh, this or that? What if we make some mistake in deriving astrometric coordinates? What uh, if our calibration accuracy will be something percent? A simulation pipeline can help to answer these questions because you just simply run it in the nominal case and then you rerun it including the non-ideality -ideal, um, uh, you wanted to study. Then you compare the results. We did not invent the LSP Street Pipeline from scratch as uh, we had uh, a lot of experience, I had a lot of experience uh, from the Planck uh, LFI Data Reduction Pipeline, which I helped uh, to develop. Planck was a space observatory that implemented an instrument, LFI, whose design was similar, albeit more, more primitive, to LSP Strip. So let's quickly see how we developed uh, the pipeline for Planck, and then I'll describe how we improved the idea uh, for uh, LSP strip. The Planck uh, LFI data reduction pipeline was developed uh, starting from 2005, more or less. Uh, Planck was launched in the, um, 2009. It was a monolithic pipeline written in C++ with parts in Fortran. It was hard to compile because you have to hack the make file and properly point at several mixed language dependencies, C, C++, Fortran. And plus it was a command line application. Even in the simplest cases, uh, you had to hunt for its output files and manually open each of them to check the results of the simulation. Just compare these uh, with modern notebooks. <laughs> it was a somewhat hackable using an input parameter file, but for several analyses, uh, this was not enough. If we wanted to turn on or off some reduction algorithms, uh, more often than not, uh, we had uh, either to copy the main uh, program into a new C++ file and comment and comment parts uh, or play with a preprocessor to turn on or off uh, parts of the code and then compile this copy as a separate program. It was not pleasant to use it. <laughs> when we started working on Strip, we decided to avoid this approach and we chose Python as all the students in my team knew at least a bit of it. And moreover, package management is far better than C++. And notebooks let one to work interactively. However, after we started implementing stuff in Python, uh, we found that uh, my students found it hard to build performant code because if you have to know the tools you are using, uh, so the internals of NumPy, how it differs from uh, Python lists, how you use Numba, uh, the syntax uh, used by Cyton and so on. Um, so at the end, uh, we implement the most performance critical part in Fortran using F2Py to glue them together with uh, uh, the Python part. However, this was not uh, a good solution because uh, um, several members of the team uh, disliked uh, the approach uh, because now they had to learn Fortran and the tools needed uh, to bridge uh, the two languages. And moreover, zero versus one indexing for arrays uh, caused uh, a lot of headaches. So in February uh, 2018, we decided to restart from scratch and uh, rewrote everything in Julia 0.6. The first thing I had to settle out was a proper usage of Julia's package manager because I wanted the pipeline to be implemented as a library rather than a monolithic code. So um, uh, how did my students uh, 
Uh, answer to uh, to this stimulus uh, I gave them. Um, first of all, they, um, uh, with my amazement, uh, they were productive in little time, uh, despite a few shortcomings in the documentation that I'll describe later. Probably they most beloved feature, they loved it uh, from the very first instant, is the ability to use Unicode symbols. Uh, paired with the possibility to avoid the multiplication sign between a number and a variable, this uh, led them to quickly translate mathematical formulae into valid code, and they really loved it. They were amazed to learn that uh, uh, for loops that used to take so long in plain Python were so quick to run in Julia. In fact, for a few modules they ported from Fortran to Julia, the performance was on the same order of magnitude even in their very first incarnation of the code. They were amazed. Um, despite the fact that package management uh, is somewhat uh, hard to learn and, uh, let me say, uh, unexpected for a student in astrophysics, uh, the idea of having a library to simulate the instrument instead of a monolithic code helped them to organize their work, because each of them developed the scripts that listed the library as a dependency and each script as a a specific target, characterize this effect, uh, that, mm, another effect, uh, and so on. This led to a very natural workflow, and uh, it was easy to deprecate uh, all the scripts uh, while keeping the possibility to rerun them when needed. This is uh, a point for proper package management and versioning. And uh, uh, I should add that uh, they spread their experience, uh, and they still get several requests from students uh, for Julia related uh, thesis topics, uh, even today. Of course, uh, mm, not uh, everything went smoothly, uh, because, for instance, uh, uh, the fact that we decided to build a library instead of a monolithic pipeline uh, means uh, uh, that uh, um, they had to understand uh, how package management works. And uh, mm, I used the word unexpected because uh, a student uh, uh, in astrophysics uh, is willing to write code uh, that solves uh, uh, some specific uh, physical problem. Learning package management uh, is something that uh, doesn't really resonate uh, with them, but uh, in Julia is extremely important to understand it. Um, they had uh, problems uh, with Julia documentation uh, because uh, basically <laughs> <coughs> the um, Julia manual is uh, meant to be a general introduction to Julia, why I believe they were hoping for some more astrophysics related tutorial that uh, introduced them to the language. Or even if not astrophysics, uh, astrophysically related, a more tutorial-like approach where you build something that uh, is of real use. I should say that uh, Ehring Engheim is preparing a new book for Manning which follows this approach and so uh, stay tuned for uh, good news uh, with respect to this aspect. Um, surely and having a tutorial where you do something astrophysical would have helped them a lot to learn the language uh, and some uh, peculiarities of the language uh, more quickly. Also because uh, they started writing code uh, very early, but uh, it was often a not an idiomatic code, uh, which missed the several nice features of Julia. For instance, uh, their first version of the code declared the type of all the function parameters, <laughs> which is something you, of course, do not want to do in Julia. And uh, related to this, uh, after three years of work, uh, I am still not sure they have really appreciated uh, multiple dispatch, <laughs> unfortunately. And uh, mm, I don't know why, but uh, each of them missed the section performance tips in the Julia manual. This would have suggested several easy optimizations for the code, which they had to implement later in a, a code that already existed. I don't know why they missed it. Uh, probably it's easy to miss it. Uh, finally, I will report my own impressions about the task and how Julia was used for it. So far, I assumed uh, the point of view of my students. So first of all, Julia was very well received in the collaboration. It seems that it is not considered a Nick language, as most of my colleagues were intrigued by our choice of adopting it. I think that an often overlooked feature of Julia is its built-in package manager. I mean, 
it's hard to learn for a student, so okay, uh, I already said so, but it's so awesome to let somebody else install dependency for you. In C++ it was such a pain. Remember the experience in Planck LFI I described. Um, I must say that uh, I've used the multiple dispatch a lot, but uh, while developing the Stripe pipeline, I overlooked multiple dispatch and its many facets many times. Even every now and then, I realized that if I used it in some parts of the pipeline, I could have achieved terser code or better performance of even both. So, I, the teacher, I'm still learning uh, about the Julia potentialities. Uh, I will add that uh, code LLVM and code native are really awesome to hunt possible bottlenecks. Um, uh, sure, you can achieve, uh, achieve the same using a C++ compiler if you ask it to output assembler. But uh, it's not as handy as typing these comments on the REPL and instantly get the results. Unfortunately, I must list also a few cons in using Julia. So one of them, as you probably have already experienced uh, on your own, is the lack of libraries. As a matter of fact, um, to properly implement pixelization of the sky sphere, I had to develop and maintain hillpix.jl, probably some of you have uh, used it, precisely because I needed it for the LSP strip pipeline. And uh, for astronomers, uh, there is Astrolib, which uh, helped us in computing uh, um, astrometric positions. Um, it has been enough so far for uh, the LSP strip pipeline. Um, I fear that uh, sometime we <laughs> might miss uh, some features uh, that uh, are provided by AstroPy, but not in Astrolib. I haven't uh, reached uh, this point yet, but uh, it's clear by having a look at the manuals that AstroPy is uh, so huge when compared with Astrolib. So probably um, it might be a problem for uh, those who uh, need uh, more uh, sophisticated uh, astrometry computations that, uh, that has. Uh, I thank you very much, uh, and uh, the presentation uh, stops uh, here. Thank you. Great. I saw that uh, Maurizio was on, but uh, I don't see his, his videos. So we had a couple of, oh, there we go, questions oh, from the uh, Discord. Are there any that you'd like to uh, highlight and address quickly? Sorry? Were, were there any questions from the Discord that I saw you were, you were answering some in text as we went, but were there any that you would like to, to highlight for the full group? Uh, well, um, um, I was uh, still in the process of uh, reading all of them. Uh, there was a question uh, about uh, using uh, memory mapped files uh, from you, Eric, I believe. Uh, we didn't test it. Uh, probably it would have helped in uh, simplifying the code, but uh, we didn't uh, have the, um, uh, the need to save memory because, as I, as I wrote on Discord, uh, we, have, uh, um, we are lucky enough to have a um, HPC cluster with uh, enough memory for our runs. Great. Okay, well, I think the, the policy is we're supposed to only be talking about the current talk on Discord. Um, so if people want to, to move some of that to, to private discussions or follow up, um, and also you can move some of them to, to uh, pigeonhole if, if you want to discuss them more as part of the discussion at the end. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, our, our next speaker is Christian Gilbertson. They're a graduate student here at Penn State working in my own group. And we're very happy to have him describe some of the work they've been doing. Hi, I'm Christian. I use they, them pronouns. And I work with Eric Ford, our mini symposium organizer at Penn State on writing software to make it easier to find exoplanets by jointly modeling stellar and telluric variability and extremely precise radial velocity spectra. I wanted to lead with addressing some of the goals of the symposium. First being how Julie enhances my science. As we all know, Julia is extremely fast and for me, easier to read and write than other canonically fast languages like C++ or Fortran, which has made it really easy for me to bring my own code and others that I need into Julia when I need that speed. For this project, I particularly appreciated the built-in support for fast linear algebra with sparse matrices with standard library components like sparse arrays and packages like MKLSparse, the multitude of automatic differentiation packages, 
and the ease of benchmarking, benchmarking with the use of benchmark tools and flame graphs. There have been some challenges as well. The ecosystem around Julia is still developing with packages being rapidly built and depreciated. And when I do find existing packages, I often have to do some tweaking to get them to do exactly what I want. It is also sometimes a struggle to convince other people to use Julia. I had a friend at a conference come up to me and be like, oh, hey, I used the method you described in your paper for the project I'm presenting here. And I was like, cool, did he use my Julia package that the whole paper is about? They said, no, <laughs> I don't use Julia. It took a while, but I rewrote what I needed in Python. And this isn't the first time I've heard something like this. And possibly the worst thing of all, I just found out that my IDE has been de deprecated, so I'll have to move to VS Code at some point, which is annoying. OK, so what science am I actually using Julia for? So I care about exoplanets. When stars host orbiting planets, they orbit each other about their shared barycenter. The portion of the stellar motion along our line of sight to the star, in other words, the radial velocity, can be inferred from Doppler shifts that are found in repeated observations of the spectra of the star. These radial velocities, RVs, can be used to indirectly infer the presence of an exoplanet. This method is one of the most successful techniques for the discovery and characterization of exoplanets and currently the most common way to get planet masses. A significant barrier to this endeavor, however, is the existence of time variable features in the measured spectra from both telluric absorption and stellar variability. For example, there are pulsations where the outer layer of stars oscillate based on their internal structure, granulation where convecting cells move gas to and from the surface of the star, and magnetic activity like star spots caused by magnetic field flux inhibiting convection at the surface of the star. All these phenomena cause spectral line asymmetries that show up in radial velocity measurements. In addition to the stellar variability, there is also spectral variability from the molecules in Earth's atmosphere, like water and oxygen, absorbing and emitting their own light, especially in the visible and near IR portion of the spectrum. These are often called telluric, in other words, of the Earth features. We can separate out the telluric spectra from the stellar spectra by relying on the additional Doppler shift we get from repeatedly observing the star at different parts of Earth's orbit. When we look at the simulated observations in blue, we can see that while the telluric lines in green stay in the same reference frame, the stellar lines in orange sweep across the detector. This portion of the Doppler shift is well characterized. The portion of the total shift we're actually interested in is the 0.001% that remains after any corrections for motion of the observer relative to the very center of the stellar system we are observing. So here is the stellar spectra observation fitting, or SUF for short model, that we are using for what we expect for the spectral flux at each time and wavelength. It has a linear model for the telluric component which is element-wise multiplied by another linear model for the stellar component with an additional matrix multiplication here is the, seen here as the LSF matrix part to deal with the optical effects of the instrument. Because the instrument is not perfectly stable, which you can see in that bottom middle plot with those wavelengths drifting, and the motion of the Earth changes where the stellar lines are, which you can see in that bottom right plot, both models are evaluated at a constant set of wavelengths that are interpolated into the observer's frame of reference at each time. We can perform this interpolation simply and efficiently by multiplying the models by sparse transformation matrices. We also express the wavelength varying instrumental line spread function as sparse transformation matrices. While we could have used banded matrices here, we found that sparse matrices outperformed them in this case, being around twice as fast, but double the memory. So we initialize our SUF models using weighted expectation maximization principal component analysis. This ensures that our models focus on the parts of the spectrum that we care about the most. In this toy example, there's a simple Gaussian line that is growing and inverting in the middle of a spectrum where there is high signal to noise and away from the edges of the spectrum where there is very low signal to noise. If we do not include the uncertainty information, regular principal component analysis in orange is unable to identify the meaningful change that we care about amidst the high amount of variance in the wings, 
whereas EMPCA gives a good estimate for both the basis vectors and the weights. The EMPCA method was originally described in Bailey et al. 2012 and was coded 100% in Python. To get up and running using it in Julia quickly, the first thing I did was to just write a tiny module that loads it in with PyCall. In this case, it was a pleasant surprise how easy it was. The only thing was that I was still in the prototyping phase with my project, and for my problem sizes, it was taking about a minute to do each EMPCA analysis. It wasn't a blocker, but it could definitely be better. When we found that our models could be vastly improved by performing several different initializations, I didn't want to have to wait around 30 minutes just to see if my model started in the right place. It used to take a full minute just to do one analysis, but thankfully a 10x speedup was only a simple Julia rewrite away, only depending on linear algebra, and it was surprisingly short, just 100 lines of code. Um, Another aspect of this project that benefited from being in Julia was our Gaussian process regularization scheme. Essentially, we wanted to add a term to our likelihood, as you can see down at the bottom, that ensured that nearby model pixels were correlated to each other, as they physically should be. So for example, this is a model without GP regularization, and this is one with it. As you can see, the high frequency noise is highly suppressed. Typically, computing Gaussian process likelihoods is of order n cubed, but several algorithms have been developed to make it of order n for certain kernel functions. Indeed, there's already Julia code to do this in temporalgps.jl. But the problem was that it wasn't quite fast enough for our application. In particular, computing the gradient of the log likelihood with temporal GPs in the automatic differentiation package nabla.jl, the orange line, was slowing down our inference steps by a factor of 15. While it scaled well, much better than the of order n cubed as expected from the analytic version in gray, it just started out too slow. Additionally, it was also not quite calculating the gradients correctly at the very beginning of our time series, as you can see on the very left. To this end, I wrote some custom code that was heavily inspired by the temporal GPs package that is built for taking gradients with respect to the input residuals rather than the hyperparameters. As you can see on the bottom, my code is as fast as temporal GPs for calculating the likelihood in small cases and even faster for some large cases. And with some smart pre-calculation for a given model, the blue line, my method can be up to 100 times faster in this use case. And thankfully calculates the correct gradient throughout the whole time series. A quick note on why we chose Nabla instead of Zygote like Flux.jl did. Since we are using constant sparse matrices so often, we needed a package that was able to treat them correctly. At the time of testing, we found that Zygote was allocating full dense matrices in place of our sparse one whenever they were encountered, which gave the right results but was incredibly slow. Nabla is able to handle this use case as expected and treats them as constant. Unfortunately, Nabla is being deprecated at some point as this funny GitHub issue comment shows, uh, so hopefully Zygote can fix this problem before that happens. To end the talk, I just thought I'd quickly showcase what all of this code leads to. For us, it is impressive data-driven models of telluric and stellar spectra that can identify variability in both our atmosphere and the stars. The top portion of the plot shows the telluric and stellar templates, uh, which are constant in time, as well as the basis vectors on the lower portion of the top plots, which control the shape of the time variability. The bottom plots show the magnitude of the time variability for each basis vector at each time. I've also included the air masses of the observations for reference, the first set of blue points in the bottom left plot, and some stellar activity indicators, which are the first three sets of weights in the bottom right plot. Interestingly, the stellar variability that Sue found is a well-known stellar activity indicator that tracks the variation in the large H-alpha line at 6563 angstroms but it was found with no prior knowledge of line location or amplitude. 
You can compare SOOP's measurement of the indicator in yellow at the bottom to the instrument pipeline's measurement of the same thing in red. SOOF models are often able to fit each spectrum to the 1% level, as you can see in the middle portion of the plot showing the mean absolute deviation. If you combine the information from many SOOF models together, it allows us to get RD estimate estimates that meet or sometimes exceed those of the instrumental pipelines whose data we tested our models on. So with that, I will conclude. Um, thanks for listening and enjoy the rest of the session today. <laughs> Hmm, I seem to be live. <laughs> Eric, have you said anything? Yes, I was asking if you said Okay, sorry, I totally missed that. To address live. Oh, okay, I'm so sorry that I just caused that much dead air. I had it muted while, just so I didn't have to listen to myself. I'm, I'm sorry, okay. Uh, yeah, so um, the one... Yeah, one thing, big thing I would like to say is, yeah, so the EMPCA code is is currently kind of a, a smaller version of the original Python package that only, you know, does the actual, like, meat of it, like, does the EMPCA, but um, it would be really, it's already, like, basically in a module, and it'd be really easy to separate out. Uh, it's just that, like, it's it's been a, a footnote to the rest of this, even though I, I recognize it would be generally useful. Um, so I would be happy to do that if, if even one person wanted me to. <laughs> well, consider that uh, as an invitation audience to uh, Zach Christian email. Um, uh, another question that someone mentioned was the, the memory requirements in Python versus Julia. Do mm -hmm. um, you want to say anything about that here? Uh, yeah, yeah. So the uh, memory allocations that I quoted, um, the, both the number and the amounts were just me copying off what was reported by benchmark tools um, at vtime macro for running them, both the, the, the kind of PyCall version as well as my own. Um, so my guess is that since it was so much slower, I mean, it could just be, you know, Python, you know, whatever slower than Julia, but I, I also don't think their implementation was like so so much more you know brilliant than mine that you know it it was a factor of a thousand less allocations like i think it might have just been a bigger issue if it's hard to track maybe hard to track all the allocations through uh pi call but i don't know i didn't spend enough time to like really investigate that very good um anything else um Nope, thanks for coming. Also, I ne I realized I never said this, but I'm Eric's grad student. I'm not like a, you know, uh, I, I realized the last person said they were like an associate professor, but I'm a grad student. If you couldn't already tell just by how I act. <laughs> it makes your accomplishments all the more impressive. Thank you very much. <laughs> and our next speaker is Eric Agall. He's faculty at the University of Washington, where he's been doing uh, some very interesting work on analyzing extrasolar planets. And with that, make it over. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, is my slide showing up? I um, this is my first time using Streamlabs. Yes, we see your okay. slides and, and you. Wonderful. Uh, so great to be here virtually with you all, and it's also great to um, have Eric for chairing the session, as Eric was one of the folks that got me very interested in Julia in the first place. And I'll, I'm going to talk about some work that was published last year, um, <clears throat> as well as some code that we're working on, continuing to develop. I uh, first wanted to introduce my research group, um, which uh, a former student dubbed the Eagle, Eagle Rhythms Lab. Uh, we build algorithms for exoplanet transits, transit timing, exomoons, and body dynamics, um, Gaussian processes. <laughs> I'm also interested in lensing and binaries. Uh, two of my current students, Bethley Lindor and Zach Langford, have uh, bitten the Julia pill and uh, are using it in their research. Uh, Bethley for transit timing and uh, Zach for developing a photodynamical model. Uh, Tyler's also played around with it a little bit with Gaussian processes. And then there are two uh, postbacs and, uh, and undergrads working with uh, us as well and using the Julia language. My path to Julia was circuitous, but it, uh, you know, in developing these codes, um, I would develop an IDL, <laughs> uh, which was, you know, high level. I could debug easily. Uh, it was interactive. Um, 
but slow. And so then I would translate code to Fortran, which was kind of the first language I had ever learned. Um, but that, but Fortran took some time to debug. Um, and it was also not as interactive, which made it a little less convenient for doing kind of, uh, data analysis and such. A lot of my students started using Python, so I considered that and every time I tried to use it, it seemed slower than IDL, which was already slow. Um, and I found it really awkward in, to use these two languages. Jake Vanderplatz first pointed me to Julia. Jake's uh, written a book on uh, data analysis in Python. And I was complaining about Python to him. He said, well, why don't you try out Julia? Um, that was some years ago, but uh, really Eric Ford was the one that encouraged me to use Julia. And, and uh, his numerical astrophysics course notes were, were very helpful initially in getting me uh, into the Julia language. And about six years ago, I had a hard disk crash and decided I'm going to fully go into Julia and to rewrite a bunch of per, um, program or software that I'd written in this ideal Fortran uh, mode. And, you know, it was, you know, easy. All of you have probably been sold on this, but it's great developing and uh, with repo easy to develop, test, debug code. I'm really not much of a programmer, and so I really liked that interactive aspect of it. Um, and then the just-in-time compiler made it the, the speed not, no longer an issue. Obviously, you have to usually uh, tailor Julia code to make it fast, but um, that is something I'm still learning to do, but it's really great to have this kind of one language solution. So today, I'm going to report on this work on this Trappist-1 planet system of seven transiting planets. Um, several of which are in the so-called habitable zone. These are Earth-sized planets orbiting a very small uh, star. And with the discovery in 2017 of the seven-planet system, we set out to try to characterize these planets using the dynamical interactions, uh, which is referred to as transit timing variations. And so we carried out a huge survey um, with collecting 450 transits over about four years with uh, Spitzer the, was the primary data collector. Uh, we also use K2 and ground-based telescopes. And uh, with all these transits, we wanted to look at the dynamical interactions between the planets to try to measure their masses. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have some links to the code um, that was uh, produced for this paper, which is in a GitHub repo. Uh, so that's at the top here. This is using the pyplot.jl uh, caller. It, it uh, wraps the matplotlib library in Python. Um, this shows the data in purple and orange with air bars. Um, what's being plotted here are the transits of each of the seven planets, uh, two in each panel except for the lower left, which is one planet, planet D. Uh, a is, of course, the star. And what's being shown here is each transit time with the linear uh, ephemeris subtracted. And so these are the residuals of the transit times of the planets. If each planet was just by itself orbiting a star, this would be flat and it would be uh, around zero. But you can see the dynamical interactions imprinted by the planets passing one another. That causes these zigzags. You can also see the proximity to resonances of the outer planets, on the, especially on the right-hand side, um, where you get this 485-day um, oscillation, which is uh, due to the re near resonant interactions between these planets. And so uh, by fitting these data with the model, we can try to back out the, the um, masses of the planets. We also want to measure the, the size of the planets. We get that from the transit depth. Um, and the goal is to get the bulk compositions. Also, to see if there's an eighth planet in the system. We know seven are transiting. There might be an eighth one that's too small or is too long of an orbital period to have been detected. Um, and then we'd like to characterize the dynamical state, see what that informs us about the formation of the system, as well as characterizing the star, which gives us better parameters for the planets. We'd also uh, wanted to make predictions for the James Webb Space Telescope, which has already taken some data on the Trappist-1 system. And this is a great opportunity to do some compar comparisons with the terrestrial planets in our solar system. The challenge of this analysis was the high dimensionality of the problem. So we basically have five parameters for each planet. We did a plain parallel dynamical analysis with seven planets, that's 35 parameters. We also had um, a distribution of transit timing residuals that seemed to be non-Gaussian. So we used a student's distribution and parameterized that with two parameters. So 37 parameters is a very large number to try to sample, especially for a, a dynamical model, which is fairly expensive. And so writing this in Julia, the performance aspect was really important. Typically, samplers work well on low dimensions. You know, 10 to 15 dimensions is typical for the affine invariant MCMC, which uh, the EMCEE package uh, by Dan Formacki is uh, really widely used. Nested sampling is, to my understanding, also doesn't uh, scale well with dimensions. 
Um, and the problem is that random walks like American Chain Monte Carlo are diffusive and takes, it takes a long time to explore very, explore very high dimensions. Um, this leads to long correlation lengths and slow convergence. And so the cure for this dimensionality is Hamiltonian Markov Chain Monte Carlo, which is based upon gradients of um, your model. My uh, time is short, so I'm going to skip this slide, um, but I'm happy to share these slides later. Um, but the basic idea of Hamiltonian Markov Chain Monte Carlo is you actually double the number of parameters, which is counterintuitive, um, but you use Hamilton's equations to integrate in uh, energy space, adding in a kinetic energy term. And this allows you to take much larger steps and have a less correlated Markov chain. To implement this, though, requires gradients. And so we needed to develop an M-body model which provided accurate gradients of the transit times with respect to the initial conditions. Um, and so we developed M-body gradient.jl in Julia. This was a translation of a C++ uh, code by David Hernandez. Um, and it uh, it does similar things to the rebound package, which is much more um, sophisticated and has many more algorithms. But embody gradient, we really it was the first time a code was developed to take the derivatives of transit times with respect to the initial conditions of the embody integration. Now, the gradients then allow you to improve your optimization of the problem uh, and find the maximum likelihood, but it also allowed the computation of the Hessian and then enabled this Hamiltonian Markov chain, Markov uh, Monte Carlo. Um, so with this code written in Julia, we were able to sample this 37-dimensional problem uh, much more quickly, I would expect, than if we had tried it with EMC. I did have a, a co-author who reproduced this analysis um, using a GPU-based code and uh, using a, a parallel method similar to Appian invariant. Um, but it did not seem to converge as well and uh, used much, much more computer time, but I didn't do a direct computation, uh, cal comparison to that. In the process of developing this project, I, we did use the automatic differentiation aspects of Julia for some of the simpler functions, which was really helpful. Um, and the total calculation uh, took 256 uh, CPU days on a cluster. But from that, we got 6,400 effective samples for this very high dimensional problem. So the HMC aspect um, seemed to work. What I really liked in developing this was the um, multiple dispatch, um, allowing to check if the formulas that we were writing were correct and how accurate the results were. Um, multiple dispatch was great for this. So in computing the analytic gradients, um, we wanted to check are these gradients, which are fairly complicated formulas, are they correct and do we implement them correctly? And so we used um, multiple dispatch to calculate the model in big float and do a finite difference derivative and then check that against our analytic derivatives. And this made debugging and finding errors in the code very much more quick and uh, allowed me to develop the code fairly quickly. Um, so the ease of calling code at different precisions is phenomenal with and Julia. Um, this also involves just-in-time comp compilation and parametric types. Um, so the, this aspect of Julia was really uh, great. The other aspects of Julia that I really liked in this project is the fact that it's reproducible and open source, so I could share my code on, on GitHub. Um, it seemed to play well with other languages. I use, I use Matplotlib quite a bit for making plots. Um, I, I really like the readability of Julia, uh, something my students really like, and it's already mentioned. And um, I also was able to write my own optimization, the Levenberg Marquardt optimizer in particular, and I wrote, I wrote my own HMC algorithm in Julia without a hit of the performance. Um, and then the auto diff was, was great as well. We actually combined this with a previous package I've written in Julia called limdark.jl for calculating transit light curves. And Julia was also critical in getting high accuracy to machine precision, double precision. Um, there's a few problems and solutions that are listed here that were implemented in that project, but I'm not, I don't have time to go to the end of that. The great thing about that project as well was that it was much very performant in Julia. So uh, relative to the, the, the um, C++ um, code, written by Laura Kreidberg called Batman, which is widely used. We had about a factor of two times speed up. And then compared to another code that included great derivatives, because lumdark.jl also has the gradients, um, it was also faster by about a factor of three. We also found uh, great speed comparisons with other codes, which are shown on this plot in the paper. And so from this, we got derivatives of the transits with respect to the different model parameters. And then uh, we're able to uh, compute a photodynamical model for the TRAPPIST-1 system. And from this, derive very accurate radius ratios of the planets to the star, as well as the density of the star, which is um, really diagnosed by the, the duration of each transit. 
uh, this river plot shows uh, in each row a single transit of these planets. This is a, just a model, not the data. And you can see the dynamical interactions from the uh, times moving back and forth relative to a linear fit, which is uh, what the zero point is in this. The uh, x-axis are in hours for each of these panels and uh, planet B on the left is a 1.5 day period. So there's a thousand transits depicted there. And planet H on the right is about a 19 day uh, orbital period. So there's something like 80 different transits. And, uh, and so from this, we were able to get both the masses and the, the uh, radii of the planets. With the characterization of the star, then we got very precise radii and masses for these planets and the posterior probability distributions I've shown in color. Uh, the colors are actually correlated with the incident flux or the equi equilibrium temperature, which is given by the scale on the right. Um, if we knew the planets, sorry, the stars parameters perfectly, then you would get these uh, smaller uncertainties due to the uncertainties in the stellar parameters, and we get the larger ones, which are being flashed back and forth here. And I should say radius is and mass are both relative to the Earth, which is shown as that green dot on the on the dashed line, which is a model for the composition of uh, planets as a function of mass for an Earth-like composition. You can see that the Trappist-1 planets are all inflated. They all seem to lie along a single uh, mass radius relation. And so there seems to be a, a common composition of these. Um, this code is also available in that uh, Julia repository. I did run into issues with in using Julia. So the allocations in Julia um, seemed to slow down significantly, probably due to the garbage collection. And so um, we made some effort into pre-allocating um, uh, large arrays that were reused uh, in structures. This was you know, just a little complicated to do and added some, um, you know, definitely some difficulty in the development, but it did lead to a fast performant code. Um, and so it'd be nice somehow to be able to create some closures where you could um, use pre-allocated um, arrays without having to create a structure in advance. We've also found in some cases that the, the Julia performance uh, varies with system architecture. We had some case, uh, one case where tests passed in Linux and OS 10 in the cloud, but didn't pass on my MacBook Pro. And we're not really sure yet what was going on with that. So that is uh, one surprising uh, thing that we ran into recently. Um, the additive framework as well. Sometimes we, when we have an analytic derivative, we'd like to be, use, be able to use that within an automatic differentiation framework. And that uh, is something that Zach Langford's been working on. He's had um, some complications in trying to get that to work. Um, so final aspect is that Autodiff doesn't work for numerical uh, integrations and um, and can lead to numerical instability due to cancellations of numerical instability uh, or um, numerical roundup uh, errors. Sorry, that was a typo there. So that um, is something that is maybe just a general uh, problem with Autodiff. We're also, okay, so future work. Uh, we're working on, uh, we've developed actually a Slerte.jl, which is now um, out of date. It's, it was developed with an earlier version of Julia and hasn't been updated. Um, so we could use some help in updating this uh, fast 1D Gaussian process, which is probably similar to the um, other GP that was discussed by Christian. And um, this this code is does have a Julia repo and some basic documentation, but needs to be, um, uh, updated for the latest versions of Julia. We're also working on something called photodynamics.jl, which is a marriage of these two packages, limdark.jl and embodygradient.jl, to produce a differentiable photodynamical model for doing inference on large planetary systems. Um, so I'll, I'll end my talk there. Thanks very much. Thanks so much. Um, I, I should have reminded people that uh, for these live talks, we're submitting questions via pigeonhole. Um, and we have just a couple of minutes if there's anything that uh, comes in. Um, you mentioned the four diff, or I'm not sure you're using four to reverse diff through the differential equations. At mm -hmm. the Astroinformatics Summer School, we had a, a couple of nice talks by uh, Chris Rackhouse, and he had uh, examples where we actually did run an auto diff through some, some differential equations. So oh, well, that's great. To, to compare, like, mm -hmm. is it a particular you know feature of the differential equations, or is it uh, you know which verse or which di auto differentiation package you use as the engine for it that matters? But um, 
Yeah, I don't know the difference, but I'd be interested to, to maybe try to dive into to that. Yeah, that would be great because it would be nice. Not, I mean, the, I did put a lot of effort in developing this antibody gradient and taking um, careful, um, carefully into account the the cancellations which can occur in uh, derivative formulas, which leads to numerical inaccuracy in some cases. Um, so I'm not sure if auto diff would be able to handle that aspect of it as well. But uh, it'd be really great to be able to just write one code and be able to use auto diff rather than writing all the the gradients by hand. Yeah, very good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Next up is Zach Lee. Let's see. Fine. He's going to be telling us about uh, taking gradients of the Big Bang with Bolt and take it away. Uh, all right. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, but you're a little soft. So if you oh, can okay. uh, boost I'll the mic up. or move uh, closer. All right. Hello? <laughs> yes, very good. Thanks. All right. Uh, hi, I'm Zach Lee. I'm a postdoc at CETA, the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a theory code for cosmology, uh, which is actually what, uh, you know, this this will predict, make predictions for the data that Mauricio Tomasi uh, is measuring. And uh, This work is done with uh, Jamie Sullivan and Marius Malay. They're both at Berkeley. Uh, so the general cosmological uh, program involves uh, comparing astrophysical data, so measurements of the sky, for example, of the cosmic microwave background, uh, or optical galaxies, and comparing that to theoretical predictions. Uh, so here are a subset of the Einstein-Boltzmann equations uh, that describe the evolution of perturbations in the early universe. And Bolt integrates these differential equations. And doing these... Uh, this kind of analysis lets you answer really crazy questions like how old the universe is, uh, what the curvature of the universe is. Uh, it even can answer uh, particle physics questions. Uh, it turns out the growth of structure is sensitive to the sum of the masses of the neutrino species. Uh, and at the end of the day, you turn your data into these triangle plots uh, that uh, show your, your Bayesian uh, posterior estimate. So Bolt is uh, at a code for linear perturbation theory. And so this describes uh, pretty well the dynamics of the early universe, where things are mostly homogenous. Uh, so here, in fact, is a transfer function from Bolt showing the evolution of photons uh, in blue, uh, going doing some oscillations, uh, as well as the evolution of the metric and baryons. So this is a, a linearization of uh, general relativity. Uh, and so just a now lightning review of this model that Bolt is integrating. Uh, it's the Big Bang. So it starts with some initial singularity, uh, 10 to the minus 32 seconds. Uh, then uh, the, the popular model is inflation. The, the universe goes through a rapid expansion period. And then uh, you know, things are very hot. So particles begin to form during nucleosynthesis. You get elements. Uh, and then things begin to cool. Uh, so at the, in the early universe, things, everything is coupled. It's just one big party where every particle is interacting with every other one. Uh, but soon, different components uh, start to, to go off on their own. And, and in particular, there's a special moment uh, at the surface of last scattering where the photons finally leave the matter. Uh, and then they just keep streaming on uh, until the present. Uh, then there's sort of a quiet period during the Dark Ages uh, where not much happens. And then we get to the exciting stuff. You know, stars and galaxies form. Uh, eventually, 13.8 billion years later, uh, we get to galaxies like the Milky Way, where we live. Uh, so Bolt simulates the evolution of the universe uh, basically in this panel to the left. That, that is uh, where linear theory describes perturbations well. Uh, and the smoking gun for this model has been the observation of the, the cosmic microwave background. So here's uh, Penzias and Wilson. And we get uh, just progressively better data of this, uh, this cosmic microwave background. So here are three satellite experiments uh, that, that have shown you know, these anisotropies. And you know, one of the key statistics uh, of cosmology has been the, the power spectrum of these anisotropies. Uh, so here is the two-point function uh, measured by Planck uh, of the CMB temperature 
power spectrum. Uh, and this power spectrum is very sensitive to uh, the physics of our universe. So for example, uh, is our universe flat or is it open or closed? Well, you can tell based on the positions of the peaks of the CMB. Uh, similarly, uh, the, the CMB gives really good evidence for dark matter. So the relative heights of the peaks uh, basically tells you about the oscillations that happen in the early universe and sort of require some, some component that uh, makes deep uh, potential wells. Uh, and that's what Bolt computes uh, is observables like the CMB power spectrum. Uh, that is uh, pr predictions of the linear theory. So in black is a, a prediction uh, by Bolt uh, of the CMB power spectrum in temperature. And uh, so Bolt is the first differentiable uh, Boltzmann code. Uh, it also computes the gradient uh, with respect to cosmological parameters. And so another uh, observable of the linear theory is the, the linear matter power spectrum. So this goes into the, the large scale structure. And so here is a, a matter power spectrum from Bolt, as well as the gradient with respect to parameters. Uh, so how does, how does uh, Julia play into this? So the important thing here is AD. Uh, Bolt is using forward diff to obtain gradients. And this would be pretty hard to achieve in any other language, because uh, it is pretty complicated, the control flow. Uh, so modern Boltzmann solvers have various uh, they don't just integrate the, the Einstein-Boltzmann equations. They have to apply various approximations uh, at various times. Also, you have uh, these fitting uh, functions and various other interpolators uh, to make it fast. And so it's, it's not so easy uh, to just write the ODE system. Uh, so look, really looking forward to, to uh, these next generation AD systems here. Also, the core problem here is solving ODEs. These are not chaotic ODEs. It's just linear perturbation theory. Uh, so in this case, differential equations.jl is probably the best ODE suite of any language. Uh, it has such just a vast array of methods, uh, and they're all well, many of them are differentiable. And in particular, uh, this problem is very well suited to implicit ODE solvers. The physics of the early universe, uh, in, there's a long epoch where the photons and the baryonic matter are very tightly coupled uh, because the baryons are ionized and the photons uh, just uh, scatter off of them. And that makes for a very stiff ODE system. Uh, so people uh, work on various approximations to, to make this uh, solution, uh, you know, this system integrable, uh, but you can use an, a stiff solver. And these have historically not been very efficient for the problem uh, because you want to estimate the Jacobian uh, that is associated with the ODE. Uh, so using uh, automatic differentiation actually on the, the system of equations, uh, you can estimate very accurately this Jacobian. And this makes implicit solvers significantly more efficient. And the ultimate goal here is, uh, as uh, Eric was describing, uh, to, to sample better. You know, we, the state of the art in cosmology is basically Metropolis Hastings. Uh, it's, it's the sampler used in, I would say, most uh, Bayesian studies. And uh, we'd like to use Hamiltonian Monte Carlo to do more parameters and faster convergence, and also for model uh, exploration, using gradients to, to optimize. Uh, I would say there's a caveat here, which is that for the standard Lambda CDM cosmology, it's very hard to beat Metropolis Hastings. Uh, that's because people typically sample over only a few parameters. Uh, and the, the model has been very well established over the last few decades. So the proposal density associated with Metropolis Hastings uh, is very well determined. Uh, so I think this is a common story for Julia, uh, where it's hard to beat the existing C plus Python implementation for the standard theory. Uh, but for new models, uh, Bolt is, is very, very good. Uh, also, we have this vision of using Julia's composability. Uh, so the vision here is you know, concise, composable extensions to the standard model, uh, and more mixing of different ideas about the universe. So instead of everybody forking one central repository, people can just write very concise, 
packages that you know, explore new ideas about our universe. Also, Julia's package management is really good. Uh, it's such a pain to get other people's code running, and it's just so different in the Julia world. Uh, it's really a breath of fresh air. Uh, another great thing about Julia, as uh, past speakers have discussed, is the strong correspondence between the code you write and the science. Uh, so the, the dynamical system here involves interactions between the GR metric, uh, as well as different components of the universe. And on our right is a, some lines from Bolt. This is basically uh, identical to the equations in the seminal uh, Ma and Birchinger, for example. Uh, so this makes exploring theory uh, you know, very luxurious. And finally, uh, Bolt runs on GPU. Uh, so we want to sample faster. And we're solving a harder problem, because now we're keeping track of all these gradients. Uh, and so we're also working uh, on uh, developing uh, integration on GPUs. So these perturbations came from a GPU. All right, so uh, now some Julia gripes. Uh, we really want reverse mode uh, because th the problem is typically phrased as a likelihood problem, where you take a bunch of different uh, inputs and you end up with one likelihood. So in principle, reverse mode AD should be uh, much more efficient. But uh, as perhaps others have encountered, uh, Julia's automatic differentiation can at times be not very automatic. Uh, it's also hard to write efficient differentiable code if you don't mutate. Uh, also, uh, for users of Python bolts, Python wrapped Boltzmann codes, uh, those codes will have basically instant startup times. And so using Bolt with its kind of long pre-compilation uh, can be daunting for users. And then, OK, this is not something that Julia can fix, but I love Unicode. And I wish I had a complete set of subscripts and superscripts. Uh, somehow it is the year 2022, and we don't have that. OK, so just now a summary. Uh, Boltzmann codes like this that solve uh, the equations of linear perturbation theory are sort of the first step in almost any cosmological analysis. So we expect this to be a core package uh, for the sort of Julia cosmological ecosystem. And we really want reverse mode AD. Uh, we're working on this. And uh, we're hoping for also you know, the, for the ecosystem here to, to advance. Also, I just want to echo uh, something that I think Mauricio also described, which is that many cosmologists are really interested in learning Julia. So uh, especially in cosmology, kind of computational problem is a uh, very large scale. You really don't want to be writing in Python. Uh, but there's not a lot of subject-specific learning material. And so I, when I evangelize, for example, I often uh, point people to the quant econ uh, Julia ebook, which I think is very high quality. But it would be great if people could uh, instead go to some sort of astro-themed uh, tutorial uh, using concepts that they're familiar with. All right, that's that's it. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, and I found a couple of questions on the pigeonhole. Uh, one is about, uh, can we exclude the possibility that the cosmic microwave background radiation looks differently uh, from another star, and that might affect our conclusions? Oh, OK. The science question. Interesting. Um, can we exclude Is like, is it cosmological? I, I think the question is like, uh, sort of maybe from a non-astronomer, like, should we trust the uh, our view to be representative? Oh, that's a great, OK. That is a, that's a really great question. Uh, it is remarkably homogenous, so, uh, or rather isotropic. So if you point your detector in uh, anywhere in the high latitude sky, uh, you see this background radiation at 2.7 Kelvin uh, that is smooth to a part in 10 to the minus 4. So stuff that is not causally connected even, right? So opposite ends of the sky uh, all exhibit this radiation. So it seems unlikely that uh, it's something nearby. 
Thanks. Um, another question. How often do you use Unicode for, for mathematical and physical expressions in practice? Uh, so we, we use it really aggressively in Bolt uh, because perturbation theory uh, has this reputation of uh, getting quite nasty with the sort of analytic expressions. Uh, but the, the Bolt, uh, you know, the, the functions look so clean. They're straight out of the papers. Uh, this is also why I really want those superscripts and subscripts. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Can I, um, can I pay? And somebody asked, you mentioned some numerical instability issues uh, with auto differentiation. Is that only happening uh, when you do auto differentiation or also when you get uh, a normal discretization of the method? Uh, so I, I didn't mention this. Oh, maybe, sorry, uh, maybe the question just came in, but I bet that was for Eric Egal. Um, right. Well, I'll push that back to, to him and the panel. Sorry. But uh, so that, that's a good question about Bolt. So why does Bolt not exhibit instabilities for AD? Uh, this is because linear perturbation theory is not a chaotic system. Uh, we think that the evolution of the universe, the, these uh, perturbations, they they behave very nicely, uh, at least for the, the initial part. Um, and another question about how the development times of your code compared to previously used languages. Right. Uh, I think in this case, the development times are, are faster for writing the, the standard numerical implementations, uh, but one has to then spend time on these new things like uh, getting AD to work uh, or uh, running things on GPUs. And so that does take time. One thing I like is that kind of my first implementation may not be you know optimal, but it, it's it's normally pretty good, right? And, and yes, getting the last factor of two or making with AD is uh, sometimes can be challenging. It's it's not nearly the same gap as in, in other high level languages. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I love that. Uh, you can basically write out some math. Uh, and then also, you don't have to optimize everything, right? So many parts of a code can be slow because they're not run that much. But but our slow might actually be faster <laughs> if it were written some other way. Um, and then someone asked, or actually I asked, uh, you, you mentioned how uh, you know there's sort of this, this mentality thing, one gigantic like astro pie that does everything and and someone has to maintain centrally and things. And, and in Julia, there's a tendency in the software development community to use more smaller focus packages that then compose with each other to work well. Um, do, do you think that that's really limited to computer science sort of software type stuff? Or should we as domain scientists also be thinking about uh, migrating towards more focused packages um, to, to, to build for each other? Uh, wait, so could you clarify, are you suggesting we build more centralized big packages? No, I'm saying that that's sort of our tradition, right? So a small yeah. number of big central packages, but Julia sort of has this other mentality, at least the for the the low level or the, the more you know basic functionality of having smaller focus packages. And sort of asking, should we be thinking of going that way or, as well? Um, or do you see it as being different wh whether you're doing a, a domain specific problem versus a you know very generic type tool? Right, yeah, I'm very opposed to this kind of mega project. Uh, I think it can be very hard to work with. Uh, and also, you know, we're scientists, we're trying to do new things. So combining different blocks is way more exciting than making some small increment to some mega repo. Yeah, I think that'd be great if we could uh, make a little progress in that direction. Um, and then the last one, I'm curious if for Bolt you tried Zygote outside with enzyme VJPs. It looked like the code snippet you showed was fully non-allocating with mutation and would avoid the Julia runtime. A hundred percent. Okay, that that is what I want. Uh, so I've read those papers, uh, and it seems like that would be the optimal uh, set of uh, AD tools. Uh, and also, uh, I mean, those papers show it's it's like uh, order of magnitude faster than so, some of the other things. Uh, but uh, so we're using these implicit solvers where there's a bunch of BLAS calls to to do this Newton iteration. And so I think the last time we took a look, uh, Enzyme wasn't quite ready. But I I mean that. That package has been rapidly uh, developing, so I think it's it's about time that we uh, we try it again. Well, the question came from Chris Rakakis, and I suspect he's pretty Gosh. actively involved in that. So oh, maybe yeah. you can follow up to help uh, either figure out if it's ready or, or maybe get help with any remaining issues. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was a, a great talk, and thanks for all the questions from the audience as well. Um, next up, we have Marius Malia. Uh, who's going to be telling us, oh, uh, <laughs> 
is that the right slide? No, the, the other one. Oh, oh, sorry. I see. That's the live demo one. Yes, um, we'll here we there. go. Uh, about high initial inference on the CMB. Take it away. Okay. Well, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Marius Malaya. Uh, I am a research scientist at uh, UC Berkeley and Davis. And I will tell you about um, how we are doing high dimensional inference from the cosmic microwave background that Zach just talked about um, on GPU with Autodiff and, and all the stuff we're doing. So uh, outline of this talk, I'm gonna first tell you about the scientific problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and then uh, I will just get into a live demo of the main package that is implementing all of this called cmblensing.jl. Um, and I'll sort of throughout give some commentary, praise and constructive criticism uh, of Julia. And this talk is aimed, it's both aimed at actually cosmologists that maybe would use this and want to kind of see it, uh, but also just at Julia people that, you know, are interested in how we're using this technology that's been developed. So hopefully there's a little bit for everyone in here. So I work with uh, data from the South Pole Telescope and the BICEP instrument. Um, this, these are telescopes. They're exactly where you think they are based on the name. And they are measuring the cosmic microwave background, uh, which are the microwaves given off by the Big Bang. And we use this to try to understand dark matter, dark energy, uh, the properties of the Big Bang. Um, you may be wondering why uh, put telescopes in such a weird location. It turns out that the uh, South Pole is like the one of the best places to observe microwaves for two reasons. So one is that the um, it actually is a it's a desert um, despite all the snow. Uh, so there's very little um, water vapor in the atmosphere. This is great for observing microwaves because it makes the atmosphere transparent to them. Um, you'll be familiar with this if you ever forgot to put water in your ramen noodles and you put it in your kitchen microwave and it didn't really work. That's because they just went right through the cup. Um, and also it's nighttime for six months out of the year. So that has its own challenges, um, but uh, um, the advantages are that it's it makes the observing um, uh, environment extremely stable. So um, here's a simulated image of, of what we observe with these telescopes. Um, so the red and the blue spots are temperature fluctuations that are actually only one part in about uh, 10,000. So this, we're measuring really tiny temperature differences in different regions on the sky. Um, for scale, for the non-experts, I have the moon on here. Um, and then there's this little black pixel down in the corner, which you can maybe see. It's not a, that's not an accident. That's actually, if you've seen these recent uh, deep field images from the uh, James Webb Space Telescope, um, uh, these beautiful deep fields. So that's actually basically just that tiny pixel on this map. So we're looking at, at very large scales. And this is what we see, but this is actually not the way that this image was emitted by the Big Bang, um, because that light was bent uh, as it traveled to us throughout the universe. And so since this is a simulation, I can just take out the bending. And if I flip between these two now, you can see kind of this, this effect. And this is called gravitational lensing, because it, it's the light is being bent by the gravity of all the matter and the dark matter that it's passing by. So you can make a vector field for how stuff is deflected um, uh, that looks like this. And it turns out if you take the divergence of this vector field, you get a map that looks like this. And this is almost to a great approximation, literally just a map of all of the dark matter in the universe projected along these lines of sight um, all the way back to the Big Bang. And so we want to measure this and learn about the dark matter. And in practice, actually, it turns out that this vector field is curl free. So it makes sense actually to describe a scalar field, a scalar potential whose gradient is the vector field, since that contains all of the same information. And this is this uh, so-called gravitational lensing potential, this phi map. Um, and so this is, this is in practice what we actually go and try to estimate. Now, of course, we don't observe this. Um, we observe the distorted, already distorted map of the CMB. Uh, and in fact, we don't even observe this. We observe it as it's been smoothed by the finite resolution of the instrument and has some additional noise and a whole host of other kind of instrumental properties. So this is a essentially a challenging inference problem. We see this noisy distorted map and we want to reconstruct these um, uh, initial, uh, these other fields and their statistical properties to, to learn about the, the physics that we're after. So just to say there's some partial solutions that exist, this thing called the quadratic estimate. Um, 
Uh, and it can be suboptimal by like factors of, of 10 or so by the time we get to the noise levels of future experiments. Um, our solution is based on Bayesian inference. Um, so we infer the unlens CMB, this lensing potential, and, and various parameters. Um, so this is really, this is not essentially recoding something that already existed, but in a better way. This is actually kind of a new novel solution that, um, that really only exists uh, for now in Julio. Um, it's uh, it implemented in the CMB lensing.jl package, and um, we've actually done it to, sm to some small bits of data. Um, you can see just a plot here where we um, you know, we're using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling. So you can see some sampled dots there and some ellipses and, and you know, the, the details of this aren't important for this talk, but, but we can do it and it's been done to real data. So now I wanna switch over to the live demo of the, of the talk. Thank you. Um, so this package, uh, simulensing.jl, um, you can see here, you can just import it and, and a couple of other packages that'll be relevant. So the, the basic building blocks of, uh, of this code are these custom array types that um, correspond to maps, like the maps we were just looking at. Um, so here's one, which is, uh, it's called Lambert map. Lambert corresponds to the spherical projection, since we're just looking at a, we're taking the sphere and projecting it down into a little rectangle. And then I've put some dummy data in there. Um, so these are custom arrays that we've implemented. You can see they're printed uh, with some extra information com uh, compared to a normal array. And they're just totally array wrappers. So um, that original um, two by two, one, two, three, four um, is inside of this object as f.r. And then there's some additional metadata f.proj for the projection that says it's a Lambert and projection and has a bunch of, uh, of other information in it. Um, so you might have noticed actually that in the printing, um, the two the two dimensional map was actually printed as a vector, and this is actually super um, intentional. And I think uh, one reason why this package uh, ends up working really well, and just the fact that uh, it turns out it's really useful to think of these two dimensional maps as abstract vectors. Um, so much so that we hook into the abstract vector type hierarchy. So f is an abstract vector. And abstract vectors are basically just any object that you can define multiplication by a scalar in addition to other vectors. And so these maps uh, certainly have this property. So here's another map and I can multiply the first one by two, add the second one and I get an answer. Now, what's the advantage of this? It's actually mainly the fact that um, abstract vectors don't say anything about how they're represented. Uh, so they exist as like this abstract object. We can certainly represent them as like a list of the pixel values, but we can also represent them as a list of the 2D um, FFT uh, components, uh, the Fourier components of the map. So here, for example, I swap this field to uh, be uh, represented as its Fourier components. And all the multiplication and, and manipulation still means the same thing regardless of what basis the field happens to be in. So here I, I do this uh, scaling in addition and I get the same thing. And of course, CMB lensing here is showing you the result as a map, but that's kind of just an arbitrary choice. So as part of this, we have to implement broadcasting for these fields. And um, if you look at the type for this, you can see it uh, basically just holds an array and some metadata. And we have this custom broadcasting implementation. Um, there's actually an example in the Julia documentation for array and character, which is almost exactly what we need. And so um, basically everything just forwards down to the underlying array and then you carry around the metadata. So this actually works quite well. And I think it's something which would be much harder in, in any other language. You would kind of end up implementing multiple dispatch yourself almost if you tried this. We can do, uh, so these are vectors, so we can also do inner products. So F is a column vector. Um, you can transpose it and dot it with another vector and you get a number. Uh, and of course, these things don't care about what basis you're in, you get the same answer. Now we deal with maps that have like millions of pixels. Um, and so it's uh, impossible to represent operators on these maps, which would be matrices. And so they'd be million by million dimensional matrices. You can't store these. So we actually, we work with either implicit operators or diagonal operators. And so we hook into the Julia um, diagonal type. So you can put one of these vectors now, which is a 2D map, but you've splayed it across the diagonal of a matrix. 
And now when you multiply that by some other vector, um, that's just matrix vector multiplication. But again, actually, you'll remember maybe that F was a, is a diagonal in the map basis, um, but G was a Fourier object. So this multiplication automatically swaps G to the basis where it can just do this by just pointwise multiplication. So let me actually show you some not dummy data. Um, so here's kind of what the code looks like. I'm going to load up a covariance for the CMB uh, and for the lensing potential. This, by the way, is exactly the thing that would be calculated by the bolt package that, that um, Zach was just telling us about. Um, so this is now some big diagonal operator. And if I multiply the square root of this times some white noise, I essentially get simulated maps <clears throat> of the CMB and of phi. So now these look like what I was showing in the first few slides. And again, being vectors, I can do things like take an inner product with the inverse of this CF um, covariance. This is like a chi-square. It's supposed to be about um, the number of pixels, which here is, is 128 squared. Um, and I can do log determinants. And that actually is everything I need to compute posterior probability and, and do in inference. So um, for posteriors, um, we wanted to find the model in one place and generate simulations um, uh, as well as compute the posterior probability. So this is what probabilistic programming languages are for. Um, there are several popular ones in Julia, like Turing, Gen, Tilde. Uh, unfortunately, none quite satisfied everything we needed, although I actually suspect the um, uh, more sophisticated one, Sauce, might, um, but we could revisit that. Anyway, we implemented our own. Actually, amazingly, it was 86 lines of code, so it's really not a big dependency. But the way it works is that you define um, a probabilistic model uh, with this special macro type. This is how all of these work. So here we say, you know, some sigma is log normal, some x is normal, which depends on the sigma. And then you can generate simulations and you can do log probabilities. And it works just the same with our fields. So here um, I've defined a noise covariance that's going to add the instrumental noise. And this is what the model looks like. This is actually quite similar to what the real code in the package looks like. <clears throat> so you have a F that's simulated that's a, a normal, a phi map that's normal. You apply the distortion, that's this lens flow thing. You add some noise. And then you can do simulations. You can do log probabilities. Um, you can look at the simulation. So here you're flipping between the lens and the unlensed. And here, plotting um, the, the unlens, the phi map, and then finally the noisy data. Autodiff, so this is crucial for uh, inference um, in this high dimensions. We use zygote for reverse mode differentiation um, because we have uh, gradient with respect to like a million parameters of a single value, which is the log probability. Um, so zygote, if you've never used it, it's just doing chain rule through your code. So here's it is a, as an example on some simple things. And it also works on some more complicated things like taking the log probability um, of, our, of our problem. Uh, so here it's doing a gradient um, at the simulation truth. And you can actually see that uh, if you multiply by the right parameters, you can see that this gradient already gives you an estimate of, of this phi map. So things are kind of generally working. But I will highlight one thing, which was that this was kind of a pretty massive undertaking. And um, it, it required really understanding a lot of the internals of Autodiff. And, and as a quick example why, um, before wrapping up, I just want to show you um, the thing we run into all the time here. And so say that you implement your own new type, which is like your own identity type. Uh, it's going to be an abstract matrix. And all you need is to multiply this by some vector. So you define this, its identity, so it just gives you back the vector. You make one, you multiply, it works great. Now you stick it into autodiff. So say that you want to do the gradient with respect to that vector, and you're going to get an error that looks something like this. And if you dig through this, um, uh, this stack trace, you'll see that it's basically failing at a point where it actually wants the transpose, the adjoint of that identity type, which you never defined because you didn't need it. But it turns out these automatic differentiation rules need it. Um, and that's the error. So, you know, even though I didn't need it for my forward code, I need to implement the transpose for my backward code. But actually, if the package had just taken a gradient through the code that I wrote, it would have worked. And so there's solutions for th stuff like this. Um, in chain rules, it's called 
uh, macro opt out. We we actually uh, made our own version of it before that existed, but we should get rid of that and use the chain rules one. But ultimately, it's kind of it kind of feels like almost no AD on some of these custom types worked out of the box. It all required work. And I wish the situation was a little bit better. I'm certain it's a really hard problem and people are thinking about it. Um, I certainly don't have a solution. I'm just going to show um, basically we can also do this on, on GPU. Um, this part was awesome. This part worked totally out of the box. So these underlying arrays just go on GPU and everything works. And I'm going to, in the interest of time, skip over this part where I show the inference and just go to my conclusion. So um, the cmblensing.jl package, um, it's providing a unique solution that is that can provide constraints that are 10 times better than state of the art, at least once we get to the noise levels of experiments in the, in the coming few years. Um, things that were awesome were the custom array implementation, GPU, um, the speed up that we get with GPU. Um, is about 10 times. And without that, I, I, this wouldn't be possible. Um, Autodiff was a bit of a struggle. I'm really looking forward to Diffractor, which I kind of keep looking at um, uh, because it sounds like that solves a lot of these things that that plague us. Although I'm slightly worried that it seems the from just looking at the GitHub page, it does progress doesn't seem to be going uh, quite as fast. And there's lots of useful packages in the ecosystem for this kind of thing. Um, sometimes there are limitations of using them like the PPL library, but We've gotten a lot of use out of the, the generic ecosystem. So that's all I had. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, feel free to post questions to the pigeonhole. Uh, I, I had one about what was it that was missing from the mainstream PPLs that you needed to implement yourself? Yeah. So actually, if you. Um, so I, I can put back this stream. If, if you can put back the. I can go back here real quick and show you. So one of the things. Um, it actually turns out it's really useful to, um, as you're doing this forward model to store temporary variables that are not actually, um, things that are sampled. So you can see there's, if you, if you had a keen eye and saw this little arrow here, um, you might have wondered what that was. And what this is saying is that, you know, for this variable actually save it and it's returned, um, in the simulation that gets returned by, um, you know, by this this forward draw. Um, and as far as I know, none, none of the packages actually have something like this. Um, and this was really useful because we want to look at, you know, the unlens CMB, the lens CMB. We just want to have that saved before we add noise to it. Um, so that's one example. I think there's, there, there's, there's a few others. It might be worth uh, asking, I believe in Turing, there's a way to, to save the output slowly, but it might be that you have an option of do either doing nothing or everything, and, and maybe, maybe I'm not sure if you can customize, like I want to save F bar, but but not mm -hmm. a lot of other intermediates. But, but I know I, I've gotten, uh, at one point, Turing to save lots of output, so. Okay, now we should look into that, yeah. Cool. I, I would like to get, you know, uh, use as much of these other packages as, as possible. Sometimes it's a choice between, um, you know, doing something quick and dirty in 86 lines of code or, or spending, you know, time and pot potentially waiting on pull requests to, to make these other, other libraries work. But, you know, Indeed, it's often a challenge. You don't know how long you're going to have to need to invest to, to, to figure out someone else's package versus writing your own might be a little bit more predictable. So truth. Yeah. Always a tough call to make. Well, thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is William Thompson, who's going to be telling us about Julia for Adaptive Optics. Take it away. Thanks for the introduction, Eric, and hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. My name is, uh, as you said, William Thompson. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Victoria, and I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, how we are currently using Julia for Adaptive Optics on a prototype instrument that we're building. I've got to switch to my slide. So first off, uh, this work is uh, contributed by a lot of people in our group at the New Earth Lab at the National Research Council of Canada. Uh, so you can see some of their photos there and thank you all for your help on this project. Uh, a few words about our particular use case before I dive into the, the Julia specific technical details. Uh, we are working on photographing nearby exoplanets. Uh, so this is uh, direct imaging and that's where we try and see the thermal infrared from individual planets that are still warm from formation uh, as they orbit their star. Uh, we first use a chronograph to block off the intense light of the star. That's this black uh, mask here. 
And uh, eventually, if we'd like to detect Earth-like planets, uh, we'll need to be able to see objects that are 10 billion times fainter than their star. So it's a, yeah, a big challenge. Uh, so in order to make this uh, at all possible, we have to use uh, adaptive optics to correct for the Earth's shimmering atmosphere. Uh, the, the principle is to measure the distortion using a high-speed camera, or in our case, in the near-infrared, and then uh, control a deformable mirror. So that's a mirror with uh, hundreds or thousands even of flexible or of actuators which push against a flexible membrane uh, in order to correct the optical surface of the instrument in real time. Um, so adaptive optics aren't just useful for looking for planets. Uh, they are really uh, enabling technology of a lot of ground-based astronomy nowadays. Uh, once your telescope is larger than a few meters wide, uh, adaptive optics are necessary to make uh, to be able to beat what's called the seeing and uh, make the most use of the instrument. Uh, so how does an AO control loop uh, work? So uh, we have a camera uh, that is reading at at least 400 frames per second, and in today's world, uh, perhaps as much as 2,000 frames per second. These are often on the order of about 512 by 512 pixels, so not a high resolution like a digital camera, but uh, at very high speed. And then in the simplest case, you just take that image and multiply it by uh, a matrix that you've pre-computed, and then you send uh, the results of that matrix vector multiply back to the DM. So that sounds really straightforward. Um, why would I need a, a, even a programming language to do this? It could probably be written on an FPGA or something and done really quickly. Uh, well, uh, AO uh, today on real systems is a lot more complicated than that. Often we integrate uh, multiple wavefront sensors. So that's uh, cameras with their associated optics. There could be three to six different sensors or even more. Uh, telescopes and adaptive optic systems have thousands of degrees of freedom. We have lots of different uh, loop speeds interacting with each other. Uh, parallel updates of some of these matrices. Uh, people work on predictive control, so using the past behavior of the system to anticipate what the, uh, the turbulent atmosphere is going to do a few moments later. We want to be able to stream telemetry, etc. There's a lot of complexity here. Um, uh, so unfortunately, uh, adaptive optics, which uh, we, uh, is really hitting the two language problem. So these are very complex systems and we have to prototype uh, and learn as we go. Uh, but unfortunately, we uh, a big impediment to doing that is that we have to write it in a slow language first so that researchers can be productive uh, and try things out. And then it has to be written entirely from scratch by an expert team of C++ experts to achieve the high speeds and low latency needed to run it on sky. Uh, so the current current state of affairs is that uh, yeah, people often write loops uh, in the lab. They test out a small part of the problem and they write code to uh, perform those calculations in MATLAB or Python or, or often lab view actually. Um, and then uh, yeah, a, a team of experts comes in and starts from scratch. They, they actually don't even typically share code. Often they'll just write uh, diagrams and uh, communicate those to each other, which isn't terribly efficient. Uh, so in our experience, Julia is not quite yet fully able to solve this two language problem, but it can bridge the gap. Um, we can run multiple consistent two to 600 uh, frame per second loops uh, in order to experiment in the lab and for on-sky tests. So we might not be able to make something uh, a thousand percent robust in order to uh, run the, the facility class AO system of the next big telescope, but we can make it so that researchers can be productive in testing out their ideas and algorithms. Uh, so how does our Julia architecture for, uh, for AO system work? Uh, so we've written something which is a, a trait-based component system. Uh, so each type can be a device, it can be a loop or procedure or a couple of the two. Um, so it can be a device that has an associated uh, real-time loop with it. Uh, these uh, components are instantiated from a dictionary which is loaded from a config file. So everything is configuration uh, driven. Uh, there's a real-time GUI, which runs a separate render loop. This is built using this great package called Dear M GUI and, there, and uh, the associated Julia wrapper. And the uh, GUI render loop calls draw on each component at around 60 frames per second. Uh, there's a TOML uh, configuration file that is used to connect the components and stores the current state of the system. And it's all integrated with Revise so that we can uh, hot reload the code and work on the algorithm while the loop is running even. Uh, so here is a recorded demo. I'm not brave enough to try doing a live demonstration of our, uh, our control system working in our lab. Uh, there's a lot going on here, so I'll let it play a couple times and point out a few things. So uh, each of these different panels is a uh, is a, represented by a Julia object. Uh, you can instantiate more uh, one or more of them. 
and then uh, a drive called each object in order to display it on them. Uh, in parallel to this, uh, several of these are running uh, real-time control loops at 200 frames per second. Uh, you can see the, the speed of the self-coherent camera loop right here at 200 frames per second. Uh, and uh, they're interacting to be, uh, together. And then in the bottom corner, there is a latency plot. Uh, this is an older one that's showing a latency of around five milliseconds. Often we can get under one millisecond of latency. Uh, so I think I've already described a little bit of our architecture for how, uh, how this works. But yeah, each, uh, each object uh, that has a loop trait can be instantiated. There's a management layer which tracks uh, which loops are active. And each loop has the ability to post a results object from its last iteration. Other loops which depend on results from those uh, can then wait for updates using this iterator protocol with edge triggered events behind the scenes. Uh, so for what that might look like is that there's a camera posting updates at one speed, and then there is another uh, loop component which is waiting for those updates in order to perform one calculation, and then perhaps the control flow branches into two other components which uh, go off of that update. Uh, here's a little bit of Julia code to show what this looks like. Uh, on the left is a configuration file describing uh, some different devices and a couple of different loops uh, that are set up. And uh, the, the type field here uh, tells it where to look in the Julia code in order to build this device. Uh, the Julia code itself is uh, not too complicated whenever you want to create a new, uh, a new device or a loop. Uh, you, you create a struct to represent uh, the type. Uh, you describe what traits it implements. In this case, it's uh, a component. It's a device and a loop. You describe how to connect to the device, how to disconnect to the device. Uh, there's a method to write out the current status of the device. So when we uh, write a file that's been recorded, uh, we want to be able to dump the current status of all the different uh, sensors. Uh, and then there's a run loop function, which you have to, or method, which you have to define. Uh, you can wait for updates from previous loops, and then you can post results from your own. Uh, so a few limitations that we are hitting. I think this has been a, a common thread of the day. Uh, one is that uh, Spawn can launch tasks onto the GUI thread. So you can have your live GUI get bogged down trying to run real-time computations because you started a new loop. Uh, thankfully, this is now fixed on, uh, on master and should hopefully get into 1.9. There is now an option to keep uh, a separate thread pool for interactive threads, uh, which we can keep our, our main sort of survey or uh, uh, supervisory layer on. Another limitation, which has been um, something we bumped into, is that threaded callbacks from device drivers. Uh, so Julia function pointers, we write a function, we say, what do we want to do whenever there's a new frame from the camera? And we pass that into some other runtime, uh, like uh, the camera driver. And that, that runtime is going to run our Julia function. And now, if in that function we touch, uh, we make an allocation, or we do any kind of I/O, even printing to the screen, uh, there's an instant segmentation fault. Uh, this is natural. We're running uh, Julia code on a thread that Julia is not aware of. It's a very sneaky thing to do. Uh, current workarounds are some uh, nice functions in the static.jl package, but it does appear that there is progress on this front. Uh, this pull request linked here should allow. Uh, functions written in Julia to run on foreign threads uh, transparently, if I understand it correctly. Uh, but the biggest limitation that we're hitting is, uh, unsurprisingly, the garbage collector. Uh, so Julia has a stop the world GC. That means that uh, whenever a garbage collection cycle is necessary to clean up memory, all threads have to pause at the same time. Uh, and this can take a while for it to find a time. So uh, when one thread realizes that now we have to run the GC, it pauses, and then it has to wait until there's a time which, in which all the other threads pause as well. Uh, so having any thread allocate means that all threads, even critical real-time ones, uh, must eventually pause for perhaps up to a second. And this, this really kills our 99.99% latency. We can run smoothly at hundreds of frames per second, and then after a minute or two minutes, uh, the garbage lifter kicks in and uh, breaks the loop for uh, 10 seconds. So what we're managing uh, right now is uh, by triggering the garbage collector ourselves at a set interval. Uh, we can, we'd much rather know that this happens always when we, uh, we've asked it to rather than at a random time. Uh, we may have to investigate splitting loops into their own processes, uh, but this would this would be a bit of a pain. Um, I think that GC latency could be improved for this specific case with, I mean, ideally it would be a concurrent GC, so a garbage collector that doesn't have to pause our threads while it runs. Another thing that would help a lot is if we could have an arena allocator uh, for just the uh, the real-time loops. Um, there's one package that does implement this, but I haven't found that it worked for our case. 
uh, an arena allocator means that uh, you sort of pre-allocate a big buffer of memory, and then all the allocations within some chunk of code just use up space in that existing buffer, and then it's discarded at the end of a uh, loop iteration. Now, the nicest thing would be allowing non-allocating functions to continue while the garbage collector runs. So if our, our hard real-time loops could uh, could continue all the while that uh, that um, the GUI thread uh, is running. And it's, un it's sort of impossible to avoid allocations in the GUI thread because you need to, for example, format a string to describe what the current uh, status of the system is. Uh, so I think I'm actually a little bit quick, but uh, in summary, uh, so Julia for Adaptive Optics, uh, it's a great way to move very fast and get algorithms working on Sky. Uh, some tricky issues are getting fixed in Julia 1.9. Uh, but GC latency does mean that Julia does not yet solve the two language problem. It mean you know we can uh, it works great for the prototyping phase up to the point of even controlling uh, uh, prototype instruments, but it can't yet take the place of uh, a, a team of C programmers writing a real time uh, system. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um... Um, I had a question. Are you writing this on a real-time Linux, or is it a generic one? We we run this, uh, you know, at least in the testing phase, on all different platforms because it's nice to be able to test it on your laptop. Uh, so we run it on Mac and Windows and so on. But then for the the, the real device, we're writing it or we're running it on a real-time patch of the Ubuntu uh, server. And, and you mentioned sort of the, the trade-off of having every thread running at once uh, versus. Uh, I'm wondering, is there a way you could have like all the, the, the low-level threads in one kernel communicate through some channel to a, a GUI uh, thread that did the GUI alone? Yeah, it's a great question and, and uh, or a great suggestion. And something that we're thinking about is having to sort of have that process boundary between the things that have to be fast and the things that don't have to be fast. Uh, we, we may have to do that. It's not ideal because now it's, uh, well, it's just a lot of work to synchronize and, and you know, and, and deal with a code base that involves multiple different processes that all have to be started and set up communication and things. But probably that's what we'll eventually have to do. I mean, I think there, there, there probably are other applications, you know, whether it's web servers or or GUIs that, that have a similar design need. And so there might be something that you could, could reuse there. But maybe some of the listeners can chime in with a suggestion on the pigeonhole. Great. Well, thanks for, for that. Um, next up, we'll have Paul Barrett, who's going to talk to us about analyzing radio astronomy data. And for those who don't know, uh, Paul has the distinction of being one of the people who was instrumental in getting astronomers to switch away from uh, IRAF and IDL. Um, unfortunately, it was a few decades ago, and so it was to Python, which now some of us are, are sort of in the middle of trying to navigate the next transition. So I think he'll be a great person to ask some questions about uh, in the panel for ideas of, of how we can make that next transition. But first, uh, tell us about radio astronomy. Oh, I don't hear you, Paul. Uh, you're muted. I'm. I can unmute you. How about that? Try again. Oh, we, we, you're not muted, but you're very soft. Is, is there something you can do? Any switching microphones or, or moving close or anything? Okay. Um, can I try again? How's that? Excellent, thanks. All right. <clears throat> Wrong microphone. Sorry about that. Um, to start over again, I'm Paul Barrett, uh, the Associate Research Professor at uh, the George Washington University. Uh, current interest now is radio astronomy. So my talk is back to basics and analyzing radio astronomy data. Um, let's see if I can. So the outline here is <clears throat> talk about radio interferometers, the VLA historical background, different types of analysis, synthesize synthetic imaging and visibility analysis, the type of research that I do, magnetic cataclysmic variables, radio observations, and the motivation for writing this, this software called VisFit. Uh, so radio interferometers are basically, uh, they're, they're effective apertures. Their longest baseline is, uh, the effective aperture is the longest baseline between antennas. Um, the way the work, they work is the, they take the amplitude from each antenna and they correlate it. And this is called visibility data. Um, the noise associated with this data is Gaussian. 
typically. Um, <clears throat> and so an example of, uh, you know, the radio interferometer, radio interferometer is the uh, Carl G. Janskin Very Large Array, the VLA, out in Socorro, New Mexico. It has 27 antennas, or basically 357, 51 correlations. Um, each antenna has um, anywhere from 1,024 to 4096 spectral channels. And uh, integration times are any, anywhere from two to five seconds. Uh, two seconds when you're dealing with higher frequencies of 10, 20 gigahertz or so on. So uh, the amount of data you can get out can be anywhere from, you know, for one hour, uh, be 10 gigabytes up to a terabyte if you're working at really high frequencies. Uh, so it's a lot of data that one has to deal with. Um, so historically, because of that, um, well, early on, more than 50 years ago, when you only had a small number of baselines, two or three, you actually used the, what I call the visibility data, the raw data, to, to work with them. Uh, be, but as the data volumes increased and you got more baselines and wider bandwidths, uh, that became a problem because processors were slow then. Um, so less than about 50 years ago, they switched over to synthetic imaging. A lot of people were doing image type analysis. Uh, the VLA was coming online. And uh, so to create these maps, and a lot of people were looking at diffuse sources, uh, they switched over to using the fast Fourier transform to create images. And one way to detect the source is what the, this uh, algorithm called the clean algorithm. So, uh, and that right now is considered this, the orthodox way of, you know, analyzing radio astronomy data uh, and not the visibility analysis. Uh, so in terms of synthetic imaging, the pros is, you know, it's an orthodox technique. People have been working on it for 40, 50 years now. Uh, it has good performance for slow processors and small amounts of memories. Uh, some of the cons, though, is when you do an FFT, you're correlating noise across uh, samples. And, uh, and the other aspect is you're also uh, providing signal aliasing. Okay, so you can actually take a, a signal or a source from outside the field of view and you can bring it into the field of view. It's not something you really want to do. Um, a negative with a clean algorithm is it doesn't really have a rigorous stopping criteria. So things aren't really completely predictable, okay, or reproducible. Um, in terms of the current software we have out there, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory has software called CASA, uh, C-A-S-A, and it's written in C++ and has a Python wrapper around it. It's 30, 40 years old now, and so it's really not highly optimized for today's processors. Um, and so the whole technique and whole issue, with, particularly with CASA, is the, autumn, the analysis is still predicated on manual uh, analysis or semi-automatic analysis and not fully automatic. Uh, one way to get around that, these issues, is to think about looking at the raw visibility data and the pros there is, you know, the noise is uncorrelated. Um, you're, you know, you're working with Gaussian noise. Um, if you're using optimization algorithms, those have rigorous stopping criteria. Uh, so they're accurate, they're reproducible. Um, and if you work the algorithms properly, you can get the fairly high performance. Um, and of course, the big issue that I worked on is I want to do this automatically. I don't want to do data analysis manually or semi-manual, <clears throat> semi semi-automatically. Um, the cons to this is it's an unorthodox technique. People don't really think that it's worthwhile nowadays. Um, and the other issue is it can be potentially computationally intensive. Um, <clears throat> so the motivation for this is uh, the work that I do. I work with magnetic cataclysmic variables. Uh, they're interacting binary stars with uh, <clears throat> with orbital periods of 80 minutes to 12 hours, sometimes a bit more. Uh, the primary component's a white dwarf with a mass of 0.6 to 1.2 solar masses. And um, they have, the white dwarf has a strong magnetic field, anywhere from 10 to 240 megagauss. Um, its companion is a late type star of 0.15 to 0.5 solar masses. And since the orbital periods are so short, um, 
and the companion has Roche lobe overflow and basically provides matter. Um, well, basically, the white dwarf accretes matter um, from the companion star. And the magnetic field is so strong that uh, instead of uh, an accretion disk forming, which is usually what happens, you get an accretion column. And there's an example, an artist's rendition of what a magnetic cataclysmic variable might look like. Uh, and then you can see the accretion columns and the threading regions and so on. Um, so I do radio observations of these. Um, here's an example of uh, observation. The, the image on the left is the right circularly polarized seed, and the image on the right is the left circularly polarized seed. Uh, as you notice, these are point sources. Um, and you can also see they, uh, they can be highly circularly polarized. Basically, this object is 100% circularly polarized. <clears throat> um, so um, the other aspect of these sources is they're highly variable. Um, flux density, they can change their flux densities by more than 10 times. So all of these issues come, to, come down to, I don't really need to do imaging. What I need to do is photospectropolarimetry. I need to do time series analysis of spectroscopic and polarimetric data. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm working with the Stokes parameters. I is the intensity, Q, U are linear polarizations, orthogonal polarizations. V is a circular polarization. Or more accurately, I work with the R channel, RR and LL channel, the left and right circularly polarized channels. So there's a, a picture here. It's not a uh, time series analysis. It's actually a spectrum. And what you see is that the, um, the, blue, uh, <clears throat> the blue samples or blue periods are actually the left circular polarization. And the red ones are the right circular polarization. You can see that the spectrum varies. Uh, not consistently, uh, kind of randomly, and uh, it's uh, pretty much 100% circularly polarized. So uh, the motivation for writing BizFits is that currently now I have probably over 100 terabytes of data that I need to go through. I've got a large volume of data, and the current software analysis um, is just too slow. Uh, it, it, you know, I believe it can be done faster. It can be automated. Uh, and as I go back to it, synthetic imaging is not statistically rigorous um, <clears throat> because of this issue with correlated errors. It's not reproducible because the Killeen algorithm, it's actually less sensitive, okay? And because I have to make images, and typically those images kind of have to be made manually or semi-manually, semi-automatic, uh, it's slow. It will take me two to three days to generate tens to a hundred Im you know, images, which I need to do. So I need to come up with something that's a little more efficient, automated, and invisibility analysis is the approach I've taken. Um, <clears throat> as you see there, you know, it's statistically rigorous, it's reproducible. And the big positive aspect is it's 20% more sensitive. And that's a big key because a lot of my sources are four and five sigma, uh, type detections right on the limit. So if I get a five sigma detection, you know, out of a visibility analysis, in the synthetic image, it's a four sigma, it becomes marginal. But, you know, if I can make it five sigma, then I can say that I'm fairly certain there's a source there. Um, so I went back and I looked at um, what was out there. This slide might be a bit difficult to see, but there's about seven or eight uh, different uh, applications out there that one can use to do visibility fitting. And um, <clears throat> the big one is there's the one that comes with a CASA is called UV MultiFit. It has limitations. There's a more modern one called um, UV MultiFit no, is the more modern one. UV Model Fit is the older one. Um, but just, just of it is they all have certain limitations and um, a lot of them are written in Fortran. Um, you have to use the, the various data analysis environments, like Gildas is different than Myriad. So you have to learn those various data analysis environments. Um, others are written in Fortran and C. It's just kind of a mess. So I decided that I would use Julia to write my own package and try to make it uh, 
the best package that's out there. Basically, uh, provide different shapes that you can use. You can fit a delta function or a Gaussian or uh, an annulus or whatever. You can use you know multiple sources. You can fit uh, all the Stokes parameters or left and right circular polarization channels. Um, you can do you can fit the spectral app, uh, index simultaneously or, or that type of aspect. So uh, the idea is to just make it very general purpose. And so I spent about a, been working on this for over a year now called VizFit off and on. Um, benefit of using Julia is you don't have to write a sub language. <clears throat> So UV multi-fit, which is uh, its underlying code is C++, but it has a Python wrapper. It also has a sub-language. The person has to write a language so that when you enter a model, um, <clears throat> it understands what that model means, because that has to be transferred into the underlying C++ code. Julia, you don't need that. You just write Julia code. Here's an example of the base model, which is a delta function and the intensity. And it's just that simple. It's a single, <clears throat> you know, just a single line of code. Um, <clears throat> the other aspect that I wanted to do is I wanted to uh, fit, you know, the, I, the four Stokes parameters, IQ, UV, simultaneously for a particular position, or I want to look at the, the left and right circular polarizations just at a particular position simultaneously. A number of those packages that don't allow that. You can only fit one parameter at a time. <clears throat> um, and the other example is enables frequency models. There's a, an example here where there's a Gaussian model, and um, you can probably see that there. New is the, the frequency, and <clears throat> new to the seven is basically the, this spectral index. So <clears throat> that uh, you know you can do it that way. Um, the one benefit of this is um, an aspect I've been working on is making it multi-threaded, and that's provided a huge improvement in performance. Uh, for some simple data, I can get an answer out. I can generate a light curve in less than 30 minutes, whereas normally it took me, you know, one, two, or three days to do to do this. So it really improved the amount of uh, research that I can get done. Uh, future developments, it's still. This package still isn't out in the public. I haven't made it public because I don't want uh, to put it out there and have to answer lots of questions. <laughs> so when it gets to that point where I feel safe that uh, you know it's ready to become public, I will make it public. Um, the one thing I want to add and I've been working on is data selection and iteration. So if I want to make this automatic, I want to be able to say, OK, give me uh, the intensity of this object you know, every 30 seconds or every 60 seconds on at between these frequencies and so on. So uh, there's a lot of options you can do in terms of selecting the data that you want to, to generate a light curve of or a spectrum of. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and you want to be able to iterate through that. Um, so once that's pretty much complete and I'm happy with, you know, that implementation, I'll make it available. Uh, additional implement. Future developments for general constraints. Right now, I just use a simple Levin Mar Marquardt algorithm with box constraints. I'd like to make that more generalizable. Um, there's other aspects of radio astronomy data that you can take advantage of. Um, between the various antennas, you can have what they call, call closure phases and closure amplitudes. That data is available. It should be used because it will give you much better results. Um, and a big aspect of radio data is radio frequency interference and um, the L2 norm you know root, you know root means you know square type of analysis uh, doesn't do well with uh, outlier data so one way to mitigate that is to use an L1 norm I'm planning on looking into that and then the other aspect is to instead of doing local optimization is to use an algorithm that provides global optimization. One, one of those algorithms is the method of moving asymptotes, which I'm interested in. So uh, the idea is to make this generally available to people um, over time to the astronomical community. So I think it would be a great advantage. And uh, <clears throat> you know, the big benefits are improved sensitivity and potentially faster analysis. Uh, 
that's all I have to say. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, let's see. I didn't see any questions specific to this talk yet. Um, I'll repeat. Oh, here we go. Uh, refreshing. Uh, do you have access to data calibration? Can you also solve for right, left gains and D terms? Uh, what's that? I'm sorry. What was uh, that? So yes. Do you have access to data calibration? Can you also solve for right, left gains and D terms? No, I don't do that right now. That would be something to, to do in the future. <clears throat> I'm still I'm still using the uh, the VLA, the CASA uh, standard calibration pipeline to do all that work right now. Um, but CASA is rather slow, and it would be nice to expand this eventually to to actually do you know. Uh, duplicate the cost of calibration pipeline. I think it would be done much more quickly, probably in about a third to five, you know, to fifth amount of time, and much more accurately. Great. Thanks. Well, that's uh, perfect timing. Um, and so why don't people uh, move over to the pigeonhole for questions, and I will uh, pull up my own screen with, uh, let's see, share. Share screen. Here we go. So here's the questions uh, that have been upvoted so far. So and let me let me add all the panelists back to we'll get a big group discussion. Uh, warning to panelists, your video is about to be shared. Uh, do, do, do. All right. I guess we can do a big. Uh, so the first question uh, we have is, what additions or upgrades to the Julia package ecosystem do you think would be helpful for accelerating the adoption of Julia amongst the, the broader astronomical community? So uh, suggestions, uh, ideas from the panel. I can uh, take a, a quick stab at that. Um, Go for it. A little bit of self-promotion, but uh, there is a Julia Astro working group call that some of us are on. Uh, we meet about once a month, and one of the things that we've been working on is a, uh, a package called Astro Images, which is designed to take uh, the most basic step in astronomy data reduction, uh, working with uh, images straight from the telescope or in FITS files and things like that, and making that much easier for beginners to uh, sink their teeth into. Um, that is sort of one little tiny corner of what AstroPy can do. Uh, so hopefully some other little corners of that can also be bitten off by other groups of people. And over time, we can uh, have all of it covered. But um, that's sort of one of the first things that uh, we've been looking at. Um, I'd like to add that we're also uh, trying to duplicate the um, <clears throat> NOVAS, which is the Naval Observatory Vector Astrometry Package, so that you can do precession and nutation and that type of stuff and do it for um, <clears throat> NOVAS is actually quite slow because of the way it's implemented. And the idea would be to make this, uh, you know, vectorizable so you can do millions or billions of, of stars or whatever at once, you know, very quickly. So. Uh, Eric Agaw, in the, the discussion, I noticed uh, you had some comments about the reverse or the different auto differentiation tools. And it wasn't so much that they didn't work. It was that you needed a high precision. Yeah. And sometimes we had complex expressions that the compilers generated uh, you know, very large trees that had run up air and stuff. So I wonder uh, if, if that might be an area that is almost abstractable away from astronomy even, but, but might allow wide, more widespread use in scientific context with some uh, complex expressions. Yeah, no, that's a great comment. Um, I I don't know of any work being done in that direction, but it probably it might involve symbolic computation because a lot of times I, I found that I could you know cancel terms in my analytic derivatives that you know didn't appear to be canceling in the auto diff and and that seemed to generate round up or um, numerical error. And so, um, but it's not something I've pursued yet. I just did it for this one package. Yeah, um, just to just to chime in, I, I also had a similar experience when for for a previous Julia package, I was trying to get like you know analytic Hessian expressions, um, and you know those obviously blow up quite quickly uh, once you take more and more derivatives. But yeah, there was like you know I think um, 
there were lots of terms that like, you know, I had like custom little rules like to string replace like 0.0 plus whatever, or, you know, 1.0 times or any, you know, plus this term minus this term, like, it might just be in a, an annoying problem to, to generically tackle, but one I think that that might have to be at a symbolic level rather than a just so it can recognize that this is exactly equal to that. But yeah, that's that sounds useful. And then there was a, another uh, question later on about the possibility of translating parts or, or maybe even all of AstroPy, um, and. And there were some comments about, you know, maybe, maybe it doesn't make sense to translate it all, but what are the different speakers' views on uh, what sort of astronomy-specific routines or, or infrastructure we might uh, want to, to think about trying to, to encourage be built out so as to support not only ourselves, but uh, others as well? If I, if I could uh, partially answer that and then also partially answer the, the still the previous question about just general ecosystem stuff. But, sure. Um, uh, from actually, from my perspective of sort of the, you know, let's say CMB oriented cosmologists and everything, I kind of feel like all the packages you would need literally already exist in Julia, or at least the ones that would make sense to be in Julia. Um, and, um, but of course, there's always going to be little things from your old pipeline that are, you know, probably Python or something. So, so in terms of like what in the ecosystem, I actually think um, the Python interoperability if that were, you know, made even better, that could be a big help, you know, so we have PyCall. Um, it's very good. Um, sometimes there's challenges with switching the Python version. Um, it's kind of baked into the build. Um, there's Python call, which I think improves that a bit. Um, but maybe that's still younger. I haven't played with it in a little bit. Um, but then the other direction, I think that one is is a bit more lacking the calling Julia from Python. So we have the PyJulia package, but um, there's these limitations about, uh, you know, using dynamically or statically linked live Python or you know, super technical stuff, but it, it actually just ends up being Every time I have to explain it to like a student or, or something and I list out the steps and I just see what the steps are, I'm just like, what am I, what am I sending this person down this rabbit hole, you know? Um, so, so I think so, stuff like that to, to give people just this really warm, fuzzy feeling that they're not leaving anything behind, uh, that kind of thing could help. And, and the tie into the AstroPy question is that, I guess, you know, certainly large parts of AstroPy right now, given the, say, manpower we have in julia astronomy you know don't need to be re-implemented right now um but if we had just a really nice you know tight way to call them with these these interoperability packages so, so maybe a suggestion of starting with a an inter a wrapper library to provide some basic functionality and then maybe some way of tracking which which needs would be worth sort of the extra effort to, to make pure julia Yeah, there has been a request to implement, uh, you know, a SITS reader in, in Julia, but I'm not inclined to do that again. <laughs> I did the initial Python one, and I really don't want to do it in Julia. <laughs> but it would be worthwhile to have. Well, I mean, I think there might be some ideas that, uh, you know, might be appropriate for, for students who are sort of getting started in astronomy to have a, here is a reference implementation, you know, it, your results should exactly match. Uh, and there might be some opportunities to, uh, you know, make, make progress on that. Um, I know it's, okay, it's uh, Science Institute provides a lot of software support for astronomers. And so if there was an uptake of Julia at, you know, STSI, STSCI or other institutions, uh, like NRAO that are um, supporting astronomers. I, I imagine that would make it a lot easier, especially for observational applications or for folks to take up Julia. Um, I've spoken to the people at Space Telescope. I've also spoken to people at NRAO. They're not really keen on moving to Julia. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of a problem. You know, I really think we have to bring in graduate students and postdocs, you know, young people, and build it up that way. And that's the way we got you know, Python adopted 25 years ago or 20 years ago. It's the same thing, <clears throat> you know. The, the, issue, the question is, is who's going to use it, you know? <clears throat> it was the same questions we had 20 years ago. <laughs> it's all, it's deja vu. 
<clears throat> yeah, right. that actually fits in nicely to another one of the questions. Uh, are there places where filling in a gap in documentation or making improved tutorials um, might be particularly useful so that we do get the the, the younger generation not to, to, to waste their time on a dead language, but to uh, jump straight into Julia from the beginning? I have a, a few a few thoughts on that I'd like to share. Right. Um, I, I, I think I sort of echo some of the comments from the other people that we don't necessarily want to make AstroPy in Julia. We don't need to port these giant uh, package ecosystems. And actually, a lot of the packages are already there. Uh, what, what really is, I, I think, quite lacking is showing users the path towards combining them. What combinations of packages solve the problem for this user? And, and we should almost go to the point of imagining certain users or actually picking real users and seeing what tools do they use in their daily life uh, as astronomers, and how do you do that in Julia? Um, and I think a group effort from the Julia astronomy community towards documenting how you do these you know, common introductory tasks in Julia will go a long way towards easy adoption. Does anybody have, uh, I mean, I know some larger groups will create like onboarding materials for new group members. Uh, and I could see, you know, if there was some group, you know, a LIGO or a Sloan Digital Sky Server saying that it was large enough to, to make that sort of uh, investment, that that could have a, a big path, not just for their own group, but that could be the, the starting point for, you know, other groups onboarding uh, lessons and such. D does anyone have that type, even at a, a low level, for helping people uh, get started? So does the Astro Stats uh, summer program have a repository of <laughs> of tutorials that could maybe be useful? Yeah, so, so, so Christian was mentioning that Penn State runs an astroinformatics summer school every now and then. And uh, there's, I think, maybe 13, 16 labs or something we created this summer. Um, th they weren't meant as an introduction to Julia. They were meant for you know the, the underlying algorithms. Um, but with a little bit of work, someone could, could remove the GUI controls and expose the code underneath to try to uh, you know, make it so that people who, who did want to, to learn and as uh, how to implement them as well as what they do might be able to uh, benefit from that. So yeah, there, there could be, I mean, I know that some of us teach classes and, and you know, each of us has a, a fairly narrow curriculum that has to, you know, get A before B before C, but, but maybe if we aggregate those and, and collected them, we could have a, a starting off point, but I don't know, other, other thoughts? Well, you know, the people part of the you know Julia Astro group, I, I am doing a, uh, a tutorial for the ADAS, the Astronomical Data Analysis Software and Systems, the next one in, in October. I'm going to be an introduction to Julia. So that might be a kind of a starting off point or a jumping point for it. But the idea, idea is those are you know software people. So the idea is to get them familiar with, with Julia because they might actually be able to <laughs> motivate for a switch. <laughs> Yep. I, I just want to circle back to this point of um, like uh, that introductory materials uh, being super useful. So I, I have an example here in my uh, CMB collaboration. Uh, we got together and wrote some introductory materials for students to use. Uh, this was in Python. And it, the, uh, you know, there's been further developments uh, where, you know, the software has improved, but we still point students to this, this set of introductory materials because they can read it and then immediately start doing research. And so what ends up happening is that every student uh, gets started on this set of Jupyter notebooks, basically. Uh, and it's been super effective. Uh, so I, I think a similar thing could be done for Julia, for sure. And is that highly tuned to your, your particular research group, or is that sort of generic to you know, astronomy in general? So this was highly tuned to our, our uh, telescope even. Uh, but uh, I mean, I think that's part of the effectiveness is that uh, they could use these things and immediately get running with it. I think in Julia, it's not so easy, right, uh, to, to start uh, solving problems. Well, I think one of the, the I mean, so another question uh, that we had was sort of the, the tension between the omnibus package AstroPy and the, you know, here's one little package that provides three functions. And and on one hand, from a pure uh, you know, software development viewpoint, I think there is a benefit to having small focus packages. But as a new user, it can be a bit confusing because 
I might need 50 packages. I don't even know what their names are, right? And so it seems a little bit like I have to, to bump into something or know someone who knows it. And so a little bit of organization, even though they, they still may maintain you know, their individual package identity, if we had a, a astronomy you know, starting point where you know, here's the common tools we use for this type of problem, whether it be you know, optical imaging or radio astronomy or CMB type analyses, might make it so that people don't have to rediscover um, you know, re-implement only to realize that something's already existing. So, so there could be a benefit to having individual groups make focused uh, onboarding materials and then aggregating them and uh, trying to, to build off of each other. And, and making sure that these these small uh, focus packages still work together as part of a larger ecosystem as well. Uh, great to keep them focused, uh, but yeah, great to make sure that in combining two different parts of these focus ecosystem, we don't end up with uh, all kinds of issues. Well, that gets to another one of the questions, which was, you know, traditionally astronomers of uh, physicists were trained as learn the physics, maybe some math, um, and you'll pick up the coding on the side, right? And so, you know, when, when it was sort of programming and you, you didn't share code, you wrote your own, maybe that made sense. But I think increasingly now there's much more of a software engineering element. Uh, and you mentioned things like you wanted them to, to be interoperable with other packages and, and composable and, and make use of you know, trait systems and, and, and all those things start to mean that it's a, it's a bigger ask. Um, and so how do we want to be training uh, new members of the astronomy software community so that they not only can solve a particular you know, differential equation, but they can do it in a way that their small focus package is going to be interoperable, uh, composable and, and, and scalable. Um, how are people making that happen in their research groups? Um, if I can say something about this, um, I must uh, say that uh, I've often had uh, problems with my colleagues and students uh, um, because uh, mm, they are trying to use Julia, um, Julia's um, command line, Julia's REPL, as uh, if uh, it were Python's REPL. Uh, they probably experienced uh, um, uh, a very easy transition from IDL's uh, REPL to Python REPL because they are very similar, IDL and Python. But in Julia, you need to shift your mindset because uh, several things uh, are really different uh, when uh, you are using the REPL. For instance, uh, variable scope uh, in four loops, uh, the fact that uh, uh, you are um, uh, encouraged uh, to develop uh, short functions, uh, uh, people coming from a, a Python background, which is most uh, of the students I have uh, come from that background, uh, find it difficult to uh, use Julia in this way. Uh, in my opinion, one of the very first uh, things that uh, needs to get uh, um, straight uh, in a tutorial or a lesson is uh, to explain the peculiarities of Julia while cleaning out uh, any ambiguities uh, with Python. Yeah, others? I totally agree. So I, when I work with students, uh, this the fact so er, they, they learn Python first, and that fills their head with ideas about how programming should be. And so it's not like I, I teach Julia, right? It's, it's like I'm teaching the difference between Julia and Python when I work with students. Yeah, I find that, that you know, Python often forces people into this vectorized notation and, and excess memory allocation mindset um, that, that it can be very hard to undo. Um, and, and to be fair, you know, I came from C++ and I wanted to write object-oriented code because that's what I was used to. And it took me a while to sort of respect the, the functional and multiple dispatch st style so that I wasn't, uh, you know, just just translating, but I was really embracing sort of the, 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 the Julia style in a way that, that made things better. So I, I think it's a, a common problem um what what are people like have you found things that help well my approach would be to to start out with simple stuff and just have them use the you know the command line the REPL to just do simple solutions you know when python came out 20 years ago that's kind of what we how i encourage people to get started with it is just to use it you know to do simple calculations and then Hopefully they would, uh, you know, develop, get familiar with it, and uh, you know, start developing, you know, bigger programs and so on. So, 
But I, I fear I see a lot of spaghetti code and, and, you know, people not breaking things into functions and, and just, you know, the very simple things that if you say, oh, just, just get using it, you can write spaghetti code that's all one long script. And, uh, and so I, I kind of want to try to preempt that and to try to get people thinking from the beginning of, of how to write code that's going to set them up for success and, and working efficiently in the future. Yeah, I think that's a much bigger problem. <laughs> Because even people who are, you know, I've tried, you know, teaching people Python and teaching how to optimize and write good code. And, and some people, it just takes them a while. <laughs> Other strategies people have tried? I tried an experiment a few years ago for a graduate course on exoplanets to just assign the students uh, to turn their problem sets in Julia. <laughs> um, I felt that was a little daunting for them, so I had them do pair coding, and I felt like that actually um, helped them, you know, get learning Julia on their own, and then you know, using one another as references for you know, couldn't figure out something, then maybe your partner could, um, and that seemed to go well. The pandemic kind of threw a wrench in things, and folks have gone back to using Python and resisted trying to learn a new language given everything else that they're facing. And of course, the pair coding is harder when you're doing things remotely. But um, but it actually, uh, when, when it was in person and the students were, um, you know, doing their problem sets in, in Julia, some really embraced it and wrote some really elegant code and nice solutions to the problem sets. Um, and the nice thing about doing that in a, in a course as well is that um, you know the problem can be solved, and like in research where sometimes you don't know <laughs> the problem can be solved or not. I know you did that too, Eric, with your um, numerical computing course. Do you mean that the, the recent students have, have opinions on what was helpful for them? I mean, I guess like for me, it was just that I would, you know, using some interactive notebook, the cells just finished immediately. Like, you know, like that it was just so fast, you know, like it was like that it was as simple as that for me, just being like, oh, I want to do X calculation or whatever. Um, and it was like 10 times faster out of nowhere, um, you know, than doing in raw Python was like the thing that made it like, okay, this is going to probably be annoying sometimes, but like it was already like, from the get-go, I was pretty convinced, um, but I just had to see that like relevant example that was like, oh, I could see how in my work this trans this goes from oh this this code I'm running takes five minutes to run and I have to wait and do something to it is done in like you know 10, 15 seconds and I'm already you know back to it like that time difference you know is what really like bought me over, but. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I thought that the, the real time bit was was fascinating um, and probably has some pretty high performance to me. And I wonder if th there might be. I, I mean, since since Christian mentioned how that made a big impact on them, uh, does does that real time angle and interactivity, maybe visualizing data where it's maybe not quite as strict a requirement as a, a real control system? Is there maybe some like data visualization tasks that uh, there might be lessons from how you implemented the uh, control systems for for making fully interactive? I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't quite follow the question. Yeah, uh, well, I, I was still formally in the way. I guess uh, you know, Christian mentioned that that being able to see things, you know, just in execute instantaneously was, was you know a big win and had obvious benefits. Um, and I know that one challenge is in astronomy, oftentimes, you know, the, the starter problems when you're teaching students to code, they're all fast in any language because, you know, whether it's a millisecond or 10 microsecond or microsecond or 10 milliseconds, like you don't notice. It's only once you start working at problems that are, you know, 10 seconds or 10 minutes that you're like, whoa, this is critically important. Um, and, and since you had that sort of, uh, you know, really impressive accomplishments on getting, you know, millisecond latency and stuff, uh, there I realized you had a very hard problem with, you know, real-time control systems. But what about uh, tasks like data visualization, where maybe it doesn't need to be, you know, 100% real-time, but people just enjoy being able to, to interact with their data in, in useful ways, interactive fashion. Is there... Uh, I mean, the existing visualization packages aren't really designed for that, but I'm wondering if that's something that maybe you've basically been doing in, in that uh, 
visualization you showed us for the, your control panel. Uh, yeah, so I can offer a few thoughts. Uh, one is that definitely seeing those real-time visualizations has been something that turns heads, even amongst people who work on adaptive optics all the time. Um, but the, the second is also the the, the code refresh loop uh, powered by Revise. That workflow in Julia, and, and for, for visualization specifically, is uh, is really powerful um, to be able to, in this case, you you write, you know, you change the code and you click a button in the GUI and everything updates you know, within a second of compile latency is uh, is really unique. And actually, that doesn't exist in even other uh, very interactive languages for the most part, especially Python. Um, and so I, I think that's that's sort of actually integrating the, the hot reloading and changing how you're visualizing something uh, into the visualization sort of pipeline, uh, conceptual pipeline is valuable. Um, so not just advocating for Julia for how fast it is and how it can make these nice plots, but also how quickly you can move on them uh, on the fly is is really nice. I can imagine theorists who run, you know, a cosmology simulation, for example, being able to, to interactively say, like, you know, go zoom in on this cluster or, uh, you know, recompute something, including some term, right, and, and having that same type of experience, even if it's not a, an instrument, but still you know, enhance their science. You mentioned that was built on uh, on something. I forget what, what was it and, and what was your experience using that like? The, the, the GUI toolkit? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that is built on something called Dear MGUI, which is a super robust way to make sort of engineering type type GUIs. It was originally created for uh, video game designers. Um, and uh, it, it works really nicely, Julia. I have to say that the current package of it is it's gotten a little bit out of date and we wanted some new features. So we've had to we had to fork it ourselves and do some work on it. That part was a little less fun. Um, lots of C call. Uh, so uh, I'd love to see some more development on that package. Probably the person to do it is me because I'm the one talking about it right this moment. Uh, so yeah, maybe someday. Um, uh, but uh, that that's so visualizations with that package are really dynamic. They run at high speed, but because of that, they can't be all that complex. Um, and, and I think for the, the sort of dynamic visualizations astronomers are more used to, Mackie is a really good middle ground where you don't have to start talking about shaders and things, and you still get something that's fairly interactive, uh, much more straightforwardly. And, and that led us to, to another question I had here, um, which was, how do people vet packages to use in their projects um, so that when people leave your team or someone joins, they don't sort of have to start with, you know, fixing or, or dealing with an unmaintained package? So are people taking everything as it is, or do people have some of uh, some heuristics to help them make that decision. I'll volunteer that if anything hasn't been committed to in the last year, I am I'm, I'm skeptical at this stage in Julia's development of the package. You know, there, there are no done packages yet, or almost none. Uh, in, in Python or something like that, I know we've used that comparison a lot. If there's a package which hasn't been touched in a year, well, maybe it's it's done, right? Every functionality is in there and it works. Uh, unfortunately, we're not at that state in Julia, so if it hasn't been touched, uh, I'm a little worried that it's going to be touched again in future. I don't know. I kind of like the ones that do everything I need to have been touched in a year, because that means they probably won't break it in some next version. <laughs> but no, I think you make a good point. Uh, there's a, there's an easy thing to see how actively it's being developed. Um, and I guess a year is a, a, a natural time scale for really paying attention to. Um, there's also the blessing of being on the, the, the blessing of being on the Julia Astro website. Um, I think we can use that as a signifier of where people should look for the, you know, they're just starting at what packages should I use? Well, so, so, so that raises an interesting point. I think, uh, you know, on one hand, you want to have something that's, that's a, there's value in having a complete index, right, where you can find everything you need. There's also value having a highly curated, you know, these are stable, well-documented, um, but there might be things in the middle, maybe something stable, but, but not well-documented, or um, it's well documented two versions ago, but there's been some upgrades. And so thinking about how we uh, would provide that information in a way that allows people to make informed choices about what meets their needs, which sometimes may rely more on stability and sometimes more on uh, functionality or, or documentation. Um, other thoughts on how else, what are other people doing in this regard in terms of how to, how and when to include packages? Yeah, one thing I can say, so um, definitely commit uh, um, activity is a big one. Uh, GitHub stars, you know, maybe it's not the best, but we should all go and and uh, 
and just start each other's repos, you know, uh, to help bolster ourselves. Um, uh, that's a big one. And uh, maybe uh, I'm worth mentioning in some context, I don't know, but I feel like uh, it's certainly a unique thing of Julia that I really like is that if I find someone's package that um, is broken or something, you know, has some missing functionality, um, and for whatever reason, you know, maybe clearly the author has moved on, you know, something, um, it's, I'm not going to like PR their repo to fix it. You know, the, the unique aspect of Julia where you just define one of their methods in your package um, to kind of fix the one little thing that you needed. Um, that that gets gets you a lot more out of some of these packages that might have, you know, otherwise kind of been considered a bit dead. Mm -hmm. Good. Other suggestions? Do you have a specific example of that that you could share? Sure, I think I I, um, I might have even just commented it on the on the what is it pigeonhole. Um, Christopher Caucus asked about um, uh, component arrays, um, uh, and those I think maybe at the moment or last time I looked don't work with CUDA or with with like GPU backed arrays. Um, but the fix to make it work like ninety nine percent of the way, it's it's like ten lines of code and. Um, and, you know, so I could just put that in my package and, uh, and I know it works for everyone. Now, I don't mean to imply component arrays is one of these like almost dead packages or anything. It's actually awesome. And and uh, surely it'll be, you know, uh, maybe it already even has as of this recording, you know, works on with GPU arrays. But um, but even if it doesn't, you can, you know, you can make it work with your own code and then, you know, ship your own code off to some collaborator and it'll work, you know, it'll work for them as well without you having to go through the time, you know, of a PR and everything else. And yeah, I've had a, I've had a similar experience where, you know, I'll have some subset of my code. That's like, I, for, for example, there was like a six line or seven line function. I had to wrote for like some auto diff packet or for the auto diff package Nabla that I'm using when it sees like a view of an array instead of a, like, you know, it sees a sub array instead of a total array. It's like, ah, you know, I don't know what to do with that. And so all it was is just, you know, just a very simple rule to be like, if you see a view, it's just, just treat it basically like a normal array, right? Um, with the, you know, with like one or two caveats, but like, yeah, it, I've had a similar experience where like a, a package will almost do what you need. And like, sometimes it's, it's fairly simple to extend it, um, which can be nice, but also it's like annoying that you have to do the extension. Um, Um, and another question we had was about Julia's package manager. Um, and I guess, you know, depending on what you're used to, uh, it, it may seem like a gigantic improvement or it may just be different or, or you may have some, some lacking things. From, from the point of view of the astronomers uh, on, on the panel, what's their impression of the Julia package manager? Is that something that uh, they've found useful? Is that something they wish uh, had significant changes? I, I could to hop in, but I feel like you could argue the package manager is the best part of Julia. Um, and, and um, yeah, we could leverage that certainly for, you know, onboarding new people for sure. And every time I go to Python and I have to learn which of the 10 new package management environments is the best one, and it still doesn't even work as good as Julia, you know, it's, it's so nice that it's, it's one, it's built in, it's good. Um, I guess if I had to love you one, one criticism, maybe it would be nice. And I know it's being worked on optional dependencies, um, mm -hmm. having that a little better, um, Other yeah, thought on the, the package oh, manager sorry. situation for astronomy. Did you want to go William? Uh, no, you go for it. Okay, sure. Yeah. I, I was also going to just chime in and, and sing some praises. I mean, the, the only issue I've, I've really had with the package manager is if you have like and th this may be more of a condemnation of my own workflow you know than for a, of the package manager but if you have like more than one unregistered package in your de in your dependencies then it can really start to freak out um and like you have to make sure you add them like in the right order and stuff um but uh other than that you know like we recently had a, a new cluster you know made at penn state and like getting my code working on that was basically just doing like an instantiate um which is like 
you know, way easier than other languages I've had to do that for. Um, so. Yeah, I, 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 it's funny you, you commented that. I'm going to agree with both of your previous comments that, that the package manager is almost one of the best things of Julia. Uh, and your pain point that dealing with unregistered packages uh, is is still a little bit tricky. Obviously, dealing with one unregistered package is, really, is not, not a big deal at all. But if you have an unregistered package that depends on another unregistered package, well, just don't do that at the moment is the answer. And, um, Unfortunately, I want to make more than one package, and not all of them are always ready for prime time. I don't want to register them. And so the answer then is make your own private registry, which is OK, but it should be easier than that. Um, there's, it's good to have a little bit of a, a push to get people to put their stuff in the registry. So maybe it doesn't need to be 100% convenient, but it could be just a bit more convenient. One thing I, I struggled with at first was what to do with large data files. So let's say you have tests. But, but it needs to work on a 100 megabyte file to run the test. Uh, and, and of course, GitHub has its file size issues. So, so recently, I found a couple of packages, data downloaders, I think, and, and something else that, that make it a lot easier for incorporating those. Um, so I'm going to try to use those going forward, but I haven't actually incorporated into my standard uh, you know, workflow yet. So I'm, I'm eager to try that out, because that, that could resolve the, the one remaining thing that was bothering me. Uh, another question we had is, is people are wondering how the development times of our codes compared to what they might have been in previous languages. Anyone want to offer thoughts on that? That's all. That's the entire reason I, I like Julia is that I feel like I didn't write code more quickly, but it, it's hard to compare because I haven't gone back and tried to re write code, uh, say, in, in the mix of IDL and Fortran, which I wouldn't recommend anyone to try. But I know Python and C is a um, you know, pretty common mix right now uh, for my collaborators. Um, <clears throat> I've had a, I've had difficulty convincing them to use Julia, though. And I think uh, you know maybe just the inertia of doing what you know and, and um, using that is maybe hard hard enough to overcome um, that they're not really willing to take it up. I'm talking about Dan Formacki, actually, <laughs> as, uh, as well as um, Rodrigo Luger, two of my close collaborators that um, did help with the Limdark code, Limdark.jl code. But um, yeah, I feel like just being able to, you know, if I, if I have a bug and a bit of code and just being able to copy that and paste that into the repo and, you know, be able to run it and figure out what's going on is so incredibly useful and could never be done in Fortran. Um, based on my experience, I think, you know, in terms of fairly computational code, I'm probably twice as productive as I was with Python, you know, SciPy. And um, <clears throat> for really highly intensive code, you know, it's, it's, much, it's much better than that, you know, <laughs> far beyond that. You know, at some point, uh, you know, <clears throat> SciPy, you know, with uh, C, C++, you know, underlayer just takes a huge amount of effort, you know. I mean, we were aware of that, you know, 25 years ago, 20 years ago when we were developing it. We, we were aware of the two language problem, but <clears throat> we were trying to get people to move away from Fortran and <clears throat> develop, develop better, you know, software. <laughs> we thought Python was, you know, a good step in that direction. And to be fair, I think it was, <laughs> you know, but. Well, there, but I think one of the big issues at the time was there was uh, a, a lot of work being done in things like IDL, which weren't uh, open source and there were licensing issues. And uh, so I think that the transition to an open source environment meant that if you were going to write a high level language, now it could at least be open source. But to me, that was the, the big improvement in, in Python because bef before, like whenever you want to parallelize something, it was like I have to buy a hundred IDL licenses to parallelize. That was a, 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 a unfun pain point beforehand. Um, so, so, so there has been progress. Historically, uh, 25 years ago, when uh, Joe Harrington and I put out our paper for ADAS, we reviewed 25 or you know two dozen interactive data now you know languages, you know. There was this language called Glish, and there was Python and Perl, and I mean, there's just numerous languages. And so what we were trying to do was, instead of having these fork of all these interactive languages, which were never quite good enough, 
you know, we thought Python was, you know, provided the best availability of all the languages that people could coalesce around. So, you know, that's why we chose Python, you know. Plus, it allowed you to have, you know, multi-dimensional arrays, which no other language really allowed, so. <laughs> for, 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 for native Julia users, that's like, wow, how did you live back then? <laughs> Uh, well, one thing I, in terms of, you know, how productive I am, I guess, I, I think I'm, I'm much more productive, but the one thing that's always in the back of my head um, uh, is, is, could I be kind of just as productive using Jax? I, I feel like that's the, that's the one, like, close, big competitor, I guess you could say. And certainly one where when I talk to other people in astronomy and I tell them about Julia or something, they're like, oh, isn't, you know, well, I'm just, I'm using Jax already or I'm, I, Jax is the same. And it's, it's, um, and, um, yeah, I, I don't necessarily have an answer there, but just to, to, to bring that up. And I guess to say maybe that, um, you know, I have some of my own examples of, of doing, I've actually played with Jax a lot. I think it's pretty cool. Um, but ultimately I still feel like, maybe Julia took a little tiny bit more effort than that would have been, but the final product is better. Um, but it would be interesting to see if other people have examples of, you know, things beyond little toy micro benchmarks kind of between Julia and Jax, maybe in astrophysics and, and seeing, you know, how does a, a real solution um, behave? What's the runtime speed? What's the latency? What's the code look like? Yeah, I think the for a long time you could make the point that performance alone was a reason to use Julia, um, and I think Jax has made it to a point where if you're willing to to jump through the Jax you know hurdles, you can get performance that's probably similar enough that you don't really care about just about the performance difference. So um, I think the, the advantages of Julia need to be deeper than than just speed, but but go beyond that. And I think they do, but it may mean that when we're talking to to colleagues about why we use Julia, the answer has to be a little bit more nuanced than it was five years ago. Other thoughts? Well, I can add uh, that uh, one of the advantages of Julia uh, with respect to uh, uh, other compiled languages as C++ and Fortran is that uh, it's far easier for me uh, to grab some code I wrote for another context and put it uh, in my new repository. In C++, uh, maybe I've had a bad algorithm, but uh, instead of uh, uh, copying it uh, into a new project, uh, I decided that it was uh, far uh, uh, easier to rewrite it from scratch because it uh, depended on uh, complex data types that uh, I, uh, I wasn't interested in uh, bringing in. In Julia, it's uh, far easier also because uh, the language uh, prizes uh, you if uh, you write a generic function that uh, just takes uh, whatever you pass it uh, to it. This is one of the reasons why it's uh, so efficient to write code in Julia. Not the only one, but in my experience, uh, it is important. Good. We had an another question came recently about whether Julia Astro has a diversity problem. Um, I, I, I don't know the answer. I would guess that it's probably not a no because uh, Astronomy is general who wouldn't say no, <laughs> um, but but maybe instead of just a yes no question, more useful would be think about are there any things that we as a community can do to help make progress on that front? Um, anybody have ideas? It, it's it's pretty clear that yes, uh, Julian astronomy does have a diversity problem. Uh, I think we can all look at the faces on this panel and to recognize that that might be an issue. Um, I think that probably, you know, for me, one of the best avenues for improving that is uh, just working with uh, a wider and wider range of colleagues and students and helping to get them involved. Um, that, that's my own personal goals. I recently uh, thought uh, a colleague, Rodrigo Luger, made a, a really nice point about the benefits of, of making clear and concise tutorials. Went that you know, yes, 
uh, it benefited you know, maybe the person you were intentionally writing it for, but then it could also benefit other people who uh, maybe weren't your intended audience. But uh, if, if you, you know, write something that's accessible and, and well done, it will get used places that might not have the same resources at, as at, say, you know, major research universities where uh, you, know, you might have a, a friend who can help or you know, instructor who has the, the latest you know, little trick or something. So I, I think that that was something that I liked because it was very concrete and, and doable and the kind of thing I, I would like to do anyway, but I sometimes have trouble justifying, um, you know, should I really spend my time making a tutorial? Um, so I, I think I'm going to try to think about that as a, in the uh, expanding our, our outreach and broadening our community angles more. The other part is encouraging the, the many people who are part of the Julia Astronomy community, whether we know them or not, uh, to step into more visible roles. Um, you know, I, I'm personally aware of, of plenty of people who might have rounded out this panel who aren't talking here today. And some, you know, explicit invitations to those people might help. Great. Uh, yeah, I mean, my, my method involved NASA ADS searching for papers that cited Julia. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that was the, the the method for finding speakers because I, I didn't know most of you before I started. Um, and I think we've had at times over 60 people on on the, the breakout mini symposium today. And so I probably don't know most of, of those. And, and so maybe uh, we can think about a way to try to, uh, to, to find those people who are interested in contributing. We've had at least one person express interest in contributing to, to coding to help support some of the, the Astro Julia ecosystem. And so uh, hopefully we can think about how to incorporate people like them into uh, whether it's Google Summer of Code type activities um, or, or maybe someone, uh, depending on where they are and, and you know, location and career and such uh, opportunities to involve people like that in our uh, research programs. Um, other thoughts? I definitely second everything that's been said. Great. Um, let's see. Other questions on the pigeonhole? Um, we, have, we have several specific questions I kind of feel are best addressed by, by one speaker about one you know, particular topic. Um, so I'm hesitant to, to bring those up now. Um, I have a question to bring up about plotting or time to first plot, which is something that's still frustrating for me and Julia. I know there's been a lot of discussion of this on Julia uh, discourse, but um, does anyone have recommendations or favorite plotting routines for making publication quality um, figures? Because that's what we spend a lot of time as astronomers doing. <laughs> That's something where one nice example, or, or maybe you know, a set of four nice examples that people mm -hmm. can decide of like, you know, app J quality plot, scatter plot, app J quality, whatever, uh, I yeah. can imagine could get a lot of copy and paste. <laughs> yeah. um, I, 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 I've done stuff myself, but I've, I, I wouldn't pretend that it's, you know, meant to be the authoritative how to do it, but maybe the, the best way to get feedback and more suggestions is to put something out there and, and say, if, if you know, there's an improvement, submit a pull request and, and we'll incorporate other nice things. There's sometimes there's a tension between you know, the, the four line version that gets you like 90% of the way there. Like I, I find I can make a pretty good plot you know, without doing anything complicated. But then if I really want to have like the LaTeX Y axis tick mark labels, the right size, and like I end up making a, you know, several lines of code to, to set things. And I, I feel it's a little bit uh, I don't know, intimidating is the right word, but you know, it, it might be seen as uh, distracting people from the main parts of, of what you're trying to convey. So maybe we don't just need one example, but uh, a few of them for different levels of, of typesetting paranoia or, or whatever. It occurs to me that a, a, a Maki theme could be in order, uh, hmm. specifically to try and, and, and match a little bit more the styles that people normally see in journals. Um, of course, Maki does give you that level of customization uh, that you sometimes need, but it would be nice if it started something, you know, almost where you needed it. Yeah, I know that, uh, I mean, whether, I, I haven't used Maki much, but there's like the, the stats recipes, um, 
I, I sometimes use not for publication quality stuff, but just to, to get, you know, what I want to look at quickly. And I, I found those to be quite helpful. So I, it would be interesting to think if you could make recipes, not just for sort of quick and dirty plots, but for highly polished plots, um, whether that's with Julia Potts or Mackie or, or whatever. Um, nice idea. For the, for the time to first plot issue, uh, if you do the same thing, you know, basically the same types of plots, uh, package compiler now lets you build a sysimage pretty easily. So you can uh, basically have, have all your the plot routines for your most common plots. You know, for me, it's like just scatter plots, right? Uh, so, so I don't need to, to do every plot a, a person might possibly make, but with you know four little plots, you can build into a sysimage and, and dramatically reduce that time to first plot pretty well. And there's a few tools for you know, more in trying to do it automatically, right? So instead of basically writing a script, building a system for that script and then loading it, um, trying to, to make packages sense what could be pre-compiled efficiently. I've never tried any of those, but uh, it, it seems potentially useful for the, the more general uh, goal of, of decreasing time to first plot. Well, another aspect of the plotting is um... <clears throat> You know, what Julia provides is good if you're only doing, you know, several thousand points or whatever, but <clears throat> I've had data sets where I've had about a million points and it just can't handle that. <clears throat> There's just, uh, I think, too much data allocation, memory allocation. It's a, it's a weakness, <clears throat> in my opinion. I'm pretty sure I've made lots of the million points. <laughs> um... well, the ones I have took a long time. <laughs> Or just to be clear, are you just using like plots.jl or whatever? Yeah. And like trying to scatter plot a million points? Yes. Hmm. Might make a difference which which back end you're using. So things like that, I would definitely try you know a few of them before uh, polishing and such. I will do. Mm -hmm. Clearly I'm a, a Maki uh, proponent because I, I would say definitely check that out for plotting large data sets very efficiently, especially GL Maki for the big ones. Um, yeah. And that, then it has to fit in the GPU. So there might be a, a memory issue that, like I said, does it, does it have to, or is, like, can you tell it, don't try to send to the GPU? I don't know. I'll, I'll be honest. I've never, I haven't had to think about it. Um, okay. So potentially that does exist, but it's never been something I've run into and had to think about. These days, the, the high-end ones have, 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 I think, have comfortable RAM for most of the things. But I can imagine, like, on laptop chips and stuff, not having much GPU memory and uh, might. Might not well, get the full benefit. I use the integrated GPU on my laptop. Um, so whatever magic it's working, uh, it seems to be working. Huh, thanks for that recommendation. Um, let's see, a new question here. Well, some, somebody else chime in while I uh, try to load the new question. <laughs> I'll, I'll comment on time to first plot as well. Uh, you know, clearly it does still hit some people, uh, especially depending on their workflows. But uh, for me personally, it somehow stopped being a major issue in the last year. I can't identify what change it was or where, but it's no longer the thing that I look at and get frustrated with. Uh, so I think that's good progress. Well, I think there has been lots of progress in plots, uh, the, the pre-compilation being smarter, like things that used to, to be, I can't do all those that somehow, I, I forget the details, but I think there has been progress under the hood, uh, thanks to, to you know people working right. on it. Right, there was there was that thing where like if it doesn't have to pre-compile like every package every time you like first you know enter an environment, right? Like that was I feel like that was a big step forward. Where like you know if plots was already pre-compiled, it just like I mean sure it takes I don't know fifteen seconds or whatever to do using plots, but it's not like the minute plus or whatever it was before that. Um, so someone made a, a, a good point that if you, the, the speed of plotting depends a lot on how you're outputting it. So if you're writing, say, a, an SVG file versus a, a PNG or something. So it's not just the back end. It's also, uh, you know, I forget what the, the name is, but the thing that the plot goes to at the end uh, also affects the performance significantly. It's the image format. Ah, there you go. Thank you. But this is this speaks to the need for recipes because in Python, you just type in like, I don't know, plot lots of points, Python. And there's some package that wraps something that does it, right? And you don't even need to think. No brain cells are activated, right? Uh, it's, it's great. 
I love copy and pasting and stuff from the internet into my science, right? That's the ideal. <laughs> but like, so with Julia, I'd have to think like, oh, okay. I have to open up Makey. I have to pick a backend. Probably have to think a little bit about how to set up some stuff, you know? So yeah, we, we really should work on these defaults. Okay. Well, so, so, so that, that's an interesting point. There's a difference between, there's a benefit to having under the hood packages being small and focused and in, interoperable backends, but, but people don't always want all that power. And so, so even if you, you, you do have the option to go there, perhaps providing some sort of wrapper or, or not omnibus package, but like a, a larger package that, that uses, sen provides sensible defaults. So, so that the first time you can just, you know, run plot or whatever, and it does something that's probably going to be pretty good, but, but maybe as you, you sort of grow, you, you come to realize, okay, I, I want to go beyond this so that it's, uh, yeah, basically providing good defaults. And also ideally, and I'm kind of thinking like the way with the, the say it, when some of these PPLs will give you a warning message. And right now they're kind of a disaster. Right? You get, you know, pages of, of compiler flag things that say, uh, you know, incomprehensible and line 100 is like, oh, that's the problem, right? Um, and that they're sort of working on trying to make it so that the error messages will be more useful and easier to parse. Um, in the same way, if we could have uh, some a level of, sensible defaults being provided that would help us be able to go to what we want to quickly might be helpful for uh, onboarding and uh, and maybe for ourselves also to, to just spend less time on the parts we're less likely to use. Yeah, I, I, maybe a good way of saying it is I've heard this before, but um, uh, batteries included but replaceable. I feel like maybe uh, that's, that's better way of saying that, yes. Um, and I will also, I'll just to, to make the statement, which is maybe useful for someone, but I, I feel personally feel like the plots.jl plots, the default theme does not look like the plots we are used to seeing in astronomy papers. Um, just as a statement, do that what you will. Um, and I, I personally mostly just use matplotlib through, through pyplot. I mean, is that just like we're used to seeing matplotlib or is that plots.jl's default is that like personally i don't think they're you know i mean sometimes i switch it to like a dark theme or whatever it's mm -hmm. while i'm doing you know but i don't think it's bad i think it's just different maybe there's there's definitely a little bit of that going on for sure All righty. Well, uh, we're coming to our close. So uh, I'd like to say thanks to to all the speakers who uh, put, put in the effort to help educate us about the tips and tricks and, and opportunities for improvement. I think one of the things we discussed as a possible uh, outcome of this would be to, to help you know spread some of the benefits amongst the Julia community and, and maybe even attract some, some new members. So I hope that uh, there might be parts of this that you know, the YouTube videos you can refer, whether it's students or collaborators to in, in the future. Um, but also uh, if there's ideas for whether it's a Google Summer of Code or an NSF, uh, you know, part of a, a project there, NASA is working towards uh, the year of open science next year. There's going to be uh, many opportunities where we might could bring some resources to the uh, various problems are identified. And so I hope people will keep in touch, even if you're uh, you know, listening on YouTube, not registered, reach out to, to us uh, with either enthusiasm for, for implementing stuff or ideas for uh, things that we might should be incorporating when we do find someone to help implement them. Um, and hope that this will be the first of, of several opportunities to help uh, strengthen and grow the Julia Astro community. Any final thoughts? Uh, well said, and thank you for uh, hosting and planning this symposium. And yeah, thanks thank to all the people job. online who joined in. Uh, again, we've, we've had 40 to, to 70 people consistently throughout, and so uh, it was great that so many people could, could tune in live, and, and hopefully more will uh, catch up later. All righty. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Eric. Thanks. Um, thanks. Bye. Bye-bye to everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Eric.